Good morning, everyone. This is Kathleen Gray from the University of Melbourne speaking. And uh, it's nine o'clock, Friday the 3rd of July. So I'd like to kick off this morning's webinar for the record, teaching health profession students about electronic medical records. And before I go on, can I say that I thought when I titled this webinar for the record that that was a good name, but really, this should be for the patient, because really why we have got together this morning to present our work and foster discussion is because we want to ensure that healthcare is safe and efficient and that the health profession students who are training to deliver that care are really capable and clever with the tools that they have at their disposal. So we want to make sure that the people educating that next generation of health professionals has access to the best pedagogy and the best teaching tools for the purpose. So that's why we're here today. And I hope you find something of benefit for you in what we're presenting between now and noon. This is a joint event. Uh, my colleagues, Professor Chris Bain from Monash University and Associate Professor Stephen Guinea from Australian Catholic University and myself uh, all have these concerns that I've just outlined to take our teaching and learning in the health professions to the next level. So uh, we are building on some work that Stephen Guinea initiated late last year at ACU's Melbourne campus and other work that we have come to learn about from colleagues that we'll hear about later on in today's So welcome from all of us. And before we go any further, uh, I would ask that each of us spend a minute to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're working today and that we pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging among those traditional owners. I'm just going to run through why we're here today and a little housekeeping and then we'll move right into the program. So we want to share the experiences that some of our presenters this morning have had and are currently unfolding in integrating electronic medical records tools into the way they are educating students training to enter the clinical health professions. We uh, hope that this will introduce some practical teaching tools and methods that can help all of us to address this aspect of professional practice. And we want today to provide an opportunity to discuss what we can do collectively to improve the way that we support and coordinate health professional education development across all of our university degrees. In addition to today's presenters, Dr. Mark Merrily from the Center for Digital Transformation of Health will be your moderator for discussion. We ask that you please use the Zoom chat facility that you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, if you want to make a comment or ask a question, please place your text in the chat window. If there is time at the end of a presentation, Mark will facilitate some responses from the presenters as we go through. Uh, and also we've allowed some time at the end of today's program for open discussion, which Mark will facilitate. And of course, if you're not presenting, would you mind please muting your microphone so that your, your dogs and your kids and other things going on in your work environment um, are not shared with the rest of us. Uh, finally, we are going to make this webinar recording accessible 
on uh, the YouTube channel of the Center for Digital Transformation of Health. And if you would like to be advised when this is available and the URL to find it, just drop an email to our health-informatics email address. And you can also join our mailing list by so doing if you wish. Today's program looks like this in approximately 20 minute brackets. And I hope you enjoy it. And I'll be speaking to you again towards the end of the session. So now I'd like to hand over to Chris to say a few words and share his screen. Thanks very much, Kathleen. Um, just waiting two seconds for that to- I'm just going to unshare my no screen. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to try and find stop sharing, stop share. There I am. Cool. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, so, you should see my email there, which is not much help to you, but might just go to here. So, should be seeing just a quick snapshot of the part of our digital health website. So I'm just going to do a little bit of screen sharing with you, but just quickly give you a bit of an update. So for those of you who don't know me, most of my background's actually been out in healthcare. I have had an affiliation with Monash FIT for quite some time, but when I started at the university about going on three years ago, under this banner of Professor of Digital Health, first came a, a thought process and a conversation about what do we mean by that? And what do we mean by that in Australia versus how it might look overseas, because they're quite radically different. And I certainly came with no preconceptions about what an education agenda around digital health might look like. But as I started speaking to people right across the uni about what digital health is, um, especially my colleagues in the two main health faculties. So at Monash, we have a separate faculty of pharmacy, and you're gonna hear from some of those guys today about their work and then the Faculty of Medicine, which is really an abbreviation for a faculty of every other health profession. So medicine, nursing, physio and so forth. But as I spoke to people about digital health and some very real examples of it that already exist, that are way ahead, for instance, of electronic medical records uh, even, uh, people's people reacted with a combination, I think, of uh, shock, fear and, um, excitement when it came to what we should be educating our future healthcare professionals about. And so in response to that, and that happening across multiple disciplines and multiple levels, we started a conversation about, well, what does digital health education look like for uh, up and coming healthcare professionals right across the, 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 uh, the spectrum? There's separate conversations we have about, um, about digital health education for others, but this was certainly in the case of um, of healthcare professionals. And so then came a bit of a journey about what does that look like and who's gonna resource it and all that kind of stuff that we tend to have. And so um, we have a core team now of people doing digital health or you know full-time on digital health inside our faculty, but we also have a whole bunch of other people, uh, if I just skip through in the faculty doing it, but particularly Rasheen and myself. So Rasheen's a, a new appointee. She's actually stuck in ISO in the city at the minute, having just come from the UK. He's certainly been involved in similar agendas in the UK. So we'll be heavily responsible going forward for this. So we've got a whole bunch of different stuff going on that looks like digital health education with some very badly overlapping buttons in my old browser. But more, most importantly is, is this piece, and this is actually a, an ongoing program, well and truly pre-existed um, my arrival at university, run by the Faculty of Medicine and the Faculty of Pharmacy together, called the Collaborative Care Curriculum. And it's about things that make sense to educate undergraduate healthcare professionals about right across the spectrum. So things like communication skills, teamwork, Indigenous health, even that kind of stuff. And as we spoke this through more and more, um, seeing the sensible place in which to put some basic frameworks around digital health education because there's existing governance, people are used to working in this paradigm rather than having isolated conversations with every sub department and so forth, because there's 10 schools in the Faculty of Medicine alone. 
And so you can easily find this on the net um, if you just Google Monash Uni uh, Collaborative Care Curriculum, you'll get to it. But we then uh, were able to do this, and, and a huge note of thanks to Associate Professor uh, uh, Fiona, uh, whose surname's eluding me in the early hours, <laughs> and, um, and Dana Buey, who's our instructional designer, to put this together um, in recent months. And you can actually see the framework if you want to go and have a look. And so this has come from a core sort of high level topic content approach. And then they've gone through in consultation with all the leads of undergraduate education and sort of melded that into learning objectives against topics, then both a novice level and a bit of practice level. And we're currently building out modules, I've uh, done a couple so far that then the, the undergraduate uh, teaching staff can take and put into their course as they see fit in appropriate areas rather than to prescribe, you must do this subject at this time. Okay. So it's very much still a live conversation. We'll keep talking about this, we'll keep working on this. And there's other interesting pieces around uh, education pop up, especially pushing out into the health domains. We'll keep this, this core framework in mind and ask ourselves, how are we extending this? Why are we doing this additional thing? And it might make perfect sense, but how does it relate to this current thing? So Fiona Kent, and I deal with Fiona all the time, so sorry for that. Um, so really that's all I wanted to say. To me, this is the sort of entree for more of what we're gonna to hear today. And so I'm really excited to hear about uh, the stuff from Regan Street and also the work going on in Queensland with fire enabled tools, because I have had a look at that. It gets uh, this, all of these sort of technology platforms we're gonna talk about make enormous sense from a digital health informatics perspective when we know what it is we're trying to teach people um, and it makes that conversation more meaningful to then look at well, how might we use this technology or this platform to test out these um, learning objectives and give people real examples, um, as well as the role that these tools will have for people in, in the real world just in performing the day-to-day -day job, which is a related but somewhat separate conversation from my perspective. So I just finished on just saying thank you very much to um, to Stephen and Kathleen, especially Kathleen and the Centre for Digital Health Transformation. They've really driven this and pulled the whole program together. Uh, and I hope everyone enjoys it. And I hope there's some fruitful conversation as we go along, because uh, we think this is the first time this kind of thing's happened. So um, I hope everyone enjoys it. Over to you again, Kathleen. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Um, and I think just before we move on to Stephen, I'd just like to emphasize uh, our interest in an evidence-based approach to the kind of work that we're doing. Uh, and I'd like to just share my screen for one more minute to show you some resources that we put together. Uh, where is it? This one. Um, uh, when the Australasian College of Health Informatics was still itself, it is now um, merged into the new Australasian Institute of Digital Health. We created a web page, uh, which has not yet migrated, but I'm sure will, which presents an assortment of relatively recent peer reviewed sources. Uh, on how we go about educating clinicians about health informatics and digital health. There's a, a number of resources here that are freely accessible and that can help. So today's focus is really on the tools that we're using and the experiences we're having and lots of time for question and answer. But I would like to emphasize that there is a growing body of knowledge out there around the world and we really want to connect with it and, and rock it, really make it better than it is now. So um, I wonder now, Stephen, can I hand over to you and ask you whether you would like to pick up the reins on today's webinar? I can certainly do that, Kathleen. Thank okay. you very much. I'm just checking, can you see my screen? Not yet. And because I'm new here, I'd love to hear introductions from everyone when, when, when you're presenting, mm -hmm. before you present. 
For sure. Uh, just checking, can people see your full PowerPoint screen? Yes, we can. Looks great, Stephen. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, all right. So uh, my name is Steve Guinea. I'm the Associate Professor uh, of, was a coordinator of simulation at Australian Catholic University until uh, relatively recently, where I've moved into the role of Associate Dean Learning and Teaching for a Faculty of Health Sciences at ACU. Uh, as Kathleen and, and Chris uh, ref um, alluded to, we initiated a, um, a forum last year looking at electronic medical records in health professional education. And really, um, the reason for doing that was uh, from a perceived need to uh, get people together and uh, work out what is actually uh, going on in the space, not necessarily in, in healthcare, uh, in healthcare practice, but in the way that we're responding to educating uh, pre-registration or undergraduate students in our health professional programs. So that was a little bit of an exercise, but, but this is an extension of that and, and to see what, to sort of throwing the net, casting the net wide to see what, uh, what actually is happening out there, because we weren't too sure. Uh, fortunately, uh, we found quite a lot of uh, people who were kindred spirits and, uh, and opened my eyes to an area, I guess, coming from a faculty where, uh, and I'll be perfectly honest, digital health has not featured heavily uh, as far as research institutes uh, and indeed even in curriculum um, presence. So several years ago in my role as a simulation coordinator, I was interested to see, uh, I guess, using simulation as a way to replicate um, practice and prepare our students for uh, current contemporary practice. What tools were available and how we could use uh, simulation to help prepare students in their understanding and use of electronic medical records prior to commencing um, practice and, and indeed going into their clinical placements. So uh, the, the presentation I'm going to talk about today is, I guess, coming in from a different perspective to Chris presented. So um, really uh, love the collaborative model uh, that, that Monash University and other universities are adapting. Uh, unfortunately for our university, we're coming, well, not unfortunately, but we're coming from a different perspective where we're, we're pretty much coming from the, the back end. So looking to retrofit. And the reason that's happening uh, and the way I'm going to talk about that is through the use of simulation education. So a couple of years ago, this, this project really started in about 2016, 2017. And in the first instance, uh, it was for myself going out to different health disciplines and asking where, what is the need of digital health or where does digital health fit into your health curriculum? So being the coordinator of simulation for the faculty, um, we work, I work across uh, or did work across 13 health disciplines, uh, three schools, and currently we've got a coverage of about, um, it's just under 17,000 students on five campuses. So the, the, the questions, that the net was being cast fairly wide in terms of finding uh, you know, information and making things relevant for a whole range of health professional programs. What we did find and what you people can see and I think people will be aware of here today is that there is a significant use of uh, electronic medical records that's happened particularly in Australia over the last five years. So internationally 10 to 15 years, we've, or 10 years, we've started to see EMRs in practice appear. But in Australia, it really has skyrocketed. Uh, um, as I mentioned five years ago, it wasn't really on anyone's radar in our university and it certainly is now. Um, the landscape has changed significantly. Coming from a perspective of using an EMR for education and for simulation, uh, we've certainly found very quickly that, that actual EMRs are not suited for pre-registration health professional education. So there's a whole range of constraints in terms of the way they're designed and the way that uh, they can be used. And even electronic medical record training modules, so the programs that vendors create and can develop for the use of staff training in hospitals or healthcare agencies in preparing their their workforce for the use of EMRs are not suitable for simulation education for a whole range of reasons. And a lot of that is to do with the uh, using EMRs or training modules for ongoing um, unfolding case studies, which many programs use in undergraduate health professional education, having things like date and time accuracy that we can simulate, uh, and being able to archive a lot of what we've got and repurpose it in another year. Uh, really, you know, the, the EMR training modules, uh, things are starting to change, but typically they don't have the desired functionality required for simulation. There's a couple of references there that might, of might, that might be of interest. Um, the Will Banks paper is very recent in, from simulation in healthcare, and it talks about um, some desired capability of simulated EMRs for education. Uh, there is a second paper there from Sahabi and Kaber, 
uh, in 2015, a little bit older, but it's a, a really nice paper because it talks about factors in the usability and safety in electronic medical records interface design. So it's from, a, uh, from the Human Factors Journal in nine, uh, 2015. And, and it provides a nice framework for considering what might be uh, useful or what to consider if you're bringing on an electronic uh, medical record for simulation education, uh, what, what uh, in terms of authenticity and how it can be, uh, and indeed usability, um, or if you're building your own, which we'll be hearing from a number of people at uh, the sessions today as they go on. So just going back to where I started, in 2017, or between 2017 and 2019, uh, we had limited evidence of the use of EMRs or digital health in our, pretty much across the board in our health professional uh, curricula and undergraduate programs at ACU. There were some pockets of it um, evolving, but it was mostly still dominated with the traditional, um, I guess, the, the literature and the learning, learning outcomes and the materials around uh, uh, paper-based or medical records more generally. We undertook a review of the simulated EMRs on the market and found that there wasn't really anything that met our needs. A lot of uh, products on the market were discipline specific and um, they had uh, limitations uh, that, that there was a range of limitations that were there and one of the, the biggest ones was uh, cost by the time we looked at the scalability of a product uh, and how many license fees it might cost uh, for those large student numbers it was just cost prohibitive so we developed uh, our own product uh, which we've been building pretty much and piloting since 2017, 2018. Um, since that period in the last two or three years, we've been just really in a cycle of user testing and piloting. So as I mentioned, the product that we've developed, NRISE, which is an acronym for a, uh, the Electronic Medical Record for Interprofessional Student Education. The word interprofessional in there was quite important because we wanted to make a tool that could be applicable to any health profession that we uh, program that we provide at the university. So that was a, a very important factor for us. Um, so it needed to be scalable, it needed to be functional, it needed a whole range of different criteria that we set up when we started this project. Now when we started implementing this, so using um, simulation to inform curriculum, and, it, and it's a little bit of a backwards process, but the reason we took this approach was because digital health and electronic medical records it, to any substance didn't really exist in the majority of our undergraduate programs. So the biggest stakeholders and the low hanging fruit, I guess, was the, the School of Nursing for us. So it's our biggest cohort in the university, our largest program. Uh, and it's, uh, I guess, probably one of the easiest to develop an electronic medical record uh, for student use. Whilst we were building it, we were st seeking staff and, and student and uh, clinician feedback in terms of the usability and, and uh, not to make it a direct replica of a simulated medical, of an actual medical record, but of one that had the principles and the operational uh, capability that would reflect a wide range of electronic medical records. But we targeted, uh, the, the, in terms of your um, diffusion of innovation model, we targeted the innovators and the early adopters because they were the easy ones to uh, get buy-in. Uh, because these kind of concepts weren't in, in curricula already, uh, we needed people who were open-minded to trying something new, who were willing to, to take on a bit of extra work, as is always the case in, in these uh, the periods of innovation uh, and gave us greater uh, opportunities for success. The flow on from that was then the anticipation that the early adopters would, uh, the, the next people, so the, the early majority or even the late majority would see what was happening in terms of uh, what the early adopters were doing and want, would want to come on board. And indeed, three or four years down the track, we are seeing that that is happening. So the early adopters really were nursing, midwifery and physiotherapy. And that's not to say that it's across all of our programs at the moment, but we just started by piloting it and just incrementally introducing the electronic medical record into the, these programs. Now, from here on in, we're looking at curriculum integration. So again, as Kathleen alluded to, we've been focusing on the tool and we've been using the tool or using simulation to inform curriculum, understanding that's not the ideal curriculum uh, design model, very clearly understanding that's not necessarily the case. But what the approach I've taken, I guess, has been a bit of a sneaky one and using uh, the EMR or the simulated EMR as a Trojan horse, uh, per se, to uh, get uh, people on board and to make curriculum change. 
As we've been integrating the simulated EMR into the curriculum, we've been focusing, of course, on professional standards and guidelines because they vary according to health disciplines. We've been ca capitalising on topics and, and elaborating on topics that already exist in curricula. So we're not trying to make significant changes to curriculum at one time, but when the opportunity arises, we're slowly embedding uh, these kinds of activities that involve the, the EMR and then digital health more broadly uh, into curricula as we go. Um, and also expanding on activities that are already in curricula. So for a lot of our programs, documentation, uh, medical record keeping, uh, issues around legislation, all those things are already in the curriculum. So we're just uh, adding this extra layer to it or this, this more current uh, focus of, of um, medical records and documentation and technology into the curriculum. We're now at a point where extending from the, the task, I guess, if you like to look at it that way, from the simulation fo focus, and we're extending it into the theoretical components of curricula. And we're particularly seeing that with, say, a Bachelor of Nursing program. During the last three years, since we've been slowly introducing the EMR, we have had, uh, or the simulated EMR into curricula, we've had a major curriculum review. So we've been able to embed the simulated EMR across the three years of our undergraduate nursing program. And, and are starting to see real change in the way that we're focusing on this content. We're now at the point also of being able to establish formative and summative assessment throughout the curriculum. So we're really establishing a good presence within particularly the nursing curricula. Uh, and also we're looking at it a little bit uh, with the physiotherapy. We've got representation from ACU physiotherapy here today, I see. Um, so that is a piece of work, particularly at the curriculum uh, review point in time where we have a fantastic opportunity to make significant changes. I've illustrated what that looks like at the moment. So we've got a, a project at the moment where we are focusing on elaborating um, or, or integrating the EMR in a much more significant way across the uh, Bachelor of Nursing curriculum. So typically this is what we're, we're looking at uh, as an example of what I've been describing. So for the first year of a three or four year curricula, we'd have a look at really basic introduction to um, documentation, medical records, um, EMRs, digital health. And so that might just be the learning outcomes around documentation and medical records. That could be to do with legislation. Uh, the EMR, we'd focus on setting up account, logging on, accessing basic data. So going and finding a client or a patient uh, and entering data at a very basic level. At the second year, we might be looking at things to do or focusing on the retrieval and the use of data, knowing that the, chain, the ways that uh, clinicians will be accessing and using or are accessing and using data is significantly different to uh, the paper-based traditional models of records. So the learning outcomes will be things around using data for critical thinking, clinical and diagnostic reasoning. From the EMR perspective, we're putting, uh, you know, entering data at a more detailed level and particularly retrieval and access of data. So how do you go and find the information that you want? Uh, where are the various sources of information in electronic medical record? What does it look like? And, and uh, things around accuracy and, uh, and, and uh, using the data that you're finding to inform decision making. We're introducing here the idea of the digital support resources to inform uh, clinical or diagnostic reasoning because that's some of the areas that we find and as documented as particularly uh, difficult or challenging in the future for how we teach uh, diagnostic reasoning, critical thinking, how, how do we teach undergraduate students to be more critical of the information that they're getting uh, from a, a, a device or a source such as an EMR if, uh, if we're not questioning enough. So we're also looking at really highlighting the issues around security and legislation in, in the middle of the years. If we're heading towards the end of the, of the curricula, we'd be looking at the critical application. So learning outcomes around data accuracy and integrity. So if we're not putting quality data in, what are the implications of the quality of data and, and, and that we are getting out? And, um, and what are the implications on patient safety for that? We're also looking at interprofessional practice. So we're finding that the simulated EMR is a fantastic tool for um, interprofessional learning. So IPE in simulation is, is quite a headache uh, for, a universe, for, for a lot of universities and undergraduate programs. It is for us because of our large footprint and our large student numbers across our entire faculty. Uh, so to provide a quality IPE experience that every student can participate in, in a synchronous way is almost impossible. Um, we're finding from an asynchronous perspective, a simulated EMR is working really, really nicely. And so not only from an IP, IPE uh, learning perspective, but from an interprofessional practice perspective, getting students to uh, collect data, going back to the previous learning outcomes around retrieval of information, 
finding information from different pr professions and interpreting that and, and integrating that into their own practice is certainly the focus that we're looking at in the third and fourth years. In specific relation to the EMR, looking at things like risks to data quality and integrity, risks to patient safety, and making students aware of the different ways in which they can inadvertently contribute to um, uh, harm, patient harm, uh, through either the uh, misuse uh, of data or the inaccuracy of data uh, that they're either putting in or retrieving from electronic medical records, or even just understanding uh, where the data is stored. We're also focusing on, or would focus on, issues around um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and clinical decision making and seeing that as a particular challenge on how we teach students, how we develop clinical reasoning, clinical decision making, uh, diagnostic reasoning in undergraduate students when we're having an increased presence of machine learning in the tools that we're using and what does that mean. And also importantly for our university is the ethics of patient care and, and ethical practice. So the ethics of data, patient data and ethical practice. Uh, how data, you know, in electronic form, where are the risks here to um, to patients, uh, to dignity, to um, not losing the patient, the person, the humanness in digital health, uh, topics such as that. So we, I guess I'm just trying to, I guess, highlight how we are looking to use the tool as a catalyst for making uh, informing curricula for the future. So sustainability issues, I guess, that we've found from uh, this approach, particularly around the tool, has been education for the users. So that's both for the educator and the student. It's not only how to use the tool um, from a day-to-day -day perspective, but particularly for our educators, is to have the confidence to teach using a simulated EMR so that they can then instill confidence in the students in its use. The user support, uh, one of the big factors for us is sustainability and people to be able, and the autonomy um, of educators, of academics, to use the tool themselves because um, relying on a particular department to program a code to do all those things is not, uh, or set up the EMR, is not going to be a sustainable model for our university. Uh, and so setting up the, um, the support for educators and the systems and the modules so that academics can set up the EMR themselves has been a huge part of this project and is an ongoing piece of work because it's, uh, again, needs to be simple or it won't get used, um, it has the potential to drop off. The IT systems and integration components are seeing how a simulated EMR can, can integrate into other university systems, so whether it's Moodle or your, your learning management system, and in, or getting the, the, the data that you'd want, the analytics from these types of tools, from a, from a what is essential component, not necessarily, well, not a nice to have. We want to make sure that whatever we build into it is usable by our staff and our students. Uh, so taking a fairly critical approach as to how this uh, EMR is integrated into other systems. But also the system requirements, which was a bit of an unanticipated one when we started building EMR in terms of what processing speed, uh, what is the impact of processing speed that EMR has when it's open and, and being used by students and also what energy it, it uses. Because uh, again, we, we, are, we designed the simulated EMR with the prospect of having students bring their own device, so from a principle of uh, bring your own device approach. Uh, and we're finding that uh, we've really needed to consider issues around systems requirements in terms of processing speed, et cetera. I'm just gonna to come to an end now, uh, the presentation. In terms of the literature, there's a lot, there is an incredible body of literature uh, that is evolving very quickly out there in the, the setting up, the starting and the testing of uh, simulated EMRs in education from a whole range of disciplines. So I haven't put any examples up here because I guess coming from a faculty approach uh, and talking across a whole range of health disciplines, I didn't want to sort of have a focus on one more than any other. But if you're having a look in the literature, some of the things that I've found particularly useful uh, the, is the literature that's coming from countries such as Singapore or Malaysia uh, and some from Thailand where they're really again taking an approach where they're needing to develop their own EMRs to meet their needs and, and mostly that comes around cost viability or because they're engaging with other the health faculties or schools are engaging with other areas of the university or their, their institutions such as IT. Uh, if you go to the literature in America or Canada, they're getting off the shelf products, which um, certainly has been, uh, I guess, the approach that we've taken at, at ACU. So it, it doesn't take too much to find some uh, current, very current literature in this space. Um, and I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much. Wayne, do you, would you like to um, 
thanks, Steve. Um, would you like to sort of allow Steve to field the question now? I think we've got five minutes ahead of schedule. We do, we do have a few minutes. All right. So thanks, Mark. I'll let you facilitate the comments and questions. Yeah. And people who are listening, feel free to use that chat window. Yeah. To pitch a question now. And yeah. if we don't have time to deal with it now, You'll come around to it later. Yeah, I'll, um, please, feel free to, yeah, please feel free to keep posting them. I will just keep collating them and then we can kind of use them as a bit of a panel at the end. Uh, Steve, I think there's probably time for one question here and it's from Chris Bain. Um, uh, you might have seen it in the chat box, but um, maybe you could just shed some light on. So Chris has said um, how, uh, how we'd handle with students, obviously the, the hybrid, the often hybrid paper versus electronic environment they'll encounter in practice. So how you're addressing that in what they sort of see and get taught. Yeah, Chris, I love this question. Thank you very much for asking it. And, um, you know, if you could plant a question, this would be the one that, that I'd do. Because one of the things that we, this has been a tension uh, when we've been building the simulated EMR, is that because, of course, we've got resource limitations in terms of our educational designer or programmer to build the thing, um, every time we go to a different discipline or a different year level in a discipline, they'll ask for another module. So whether it's a, the um, vital science chart, whether it's progress notes, whether it's a specific assessment tool, um, all those sorts of things and that so that that's meant that it's been it, we can never meet that need and so the approach that we've taken with the simulate with the development of our MRIs is to go with the most commonly used tools that most disciplines would use in an acute care setting so we haven't moved out into community yet um, last year at the forum EMR forum I was really really excited to hear um, that from people who are much more experienced in this field than myself, that we're going to be in a hybrid model for uh, quite a number of years to come. So that was music to my ears. Um, because what that then means is it provides a justification for us to use MRIs for a particular, uh, for particular documentation in our classrooms or in our curricula. So again, like progress notes, medication uh, charts, uh, vital signs, but it also enables us to use paper-based records uh, for those um, parts of, of, of patient care that we don't um, have built into the MRIs yet. And so we're pretty much going to be continuing a hybrid model uh, for the foreseeable future, as, as far as I can see. Um, and indeed, we get a little bit of, it does create a bit of tension or it does come up in the curriculum planning component because a number of our academics will, will particularly with clinical backgrounds in intensive care or critical care areas where everything is electronic, will want to have that provided to the students. Um, and so we're able to, as part of the curriculum design approach, is able to really reassert a, a hybrid model in our teaching with the justification that we do have a hybrid model and indeed still a lot of places that are functioning purely on paper out in practice. Thanks, Steve. I hope that covers it for you, Chris. Um, uh, we can certainly keep, um, keep that up uh, later on. I think there's probably time for one more question, Steve, if you're happy, um, from Wendy. Oh. Um, is MRIs available for others and how, or is it obviously a ACU specific thing? Yeah, Wendy, that's a, a fantastic uh, question. When we first started developing it, we've of course looked at things around sustainability. We've looked at um, uh, whether it can, we can have a, um, a love gone completely blank, but you know, looking at uh, marketing and, and those sorts of things. And, and then very sort of soon found out that it's quite, if, if you're developing a tool that would go out for use from external people or who other developers would build into, uh, it could be developed in a very different way than if it's just used for a sole purpose or for a sole organisation. So our educational designer who built the thing kind of went pale when I asked about, uh, you know, if people want to contribute to this and, and build to it, what does that look like? And he said, oh, well, this is kind of built from my approach to coding and I don't know how anyone else would go with that. And it's been a similar experience I've learnt uh, over the, the time. So theoretically, um, theoretically, it is available, but operationally, it, it's very difficult to do because of the, the, the way in which the coding works and unless we did a, a complete rebuild. So I'd love to say yes. Uh, and initially, that's what I went into this project with. Over time, we found that it's uh, going to be a bit uh, prohibitive to do that, uh, or we'll need to undertake a complete rebuild. <laughs> But there are, however, a number of projects, and I think this is where these conversations and these types of forums are really important, because there are an increasingly number of uh, products on the market, some that will come at a cost, but internationally there are some that are also freely available. Um, so the National League for Nursing in, in America, for example, has a, um, 
a homegrown part of their, their community uh, where people publish uh, what's freely available, what they want to make freely available to others. And there's some electronic medical records and good resources on there. But I think we're going to hear from some other people today who may have products that are in better shape than ours for, uh, for sharing with others. Thanks very much, Steve. What a great start to today's webinar to hear the work that you've been doing. I think it's a really great segue into um, our next presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce Associate Professor Brian Chapman and Professor Wendy Chapman, both based in the Center for Digital Transformation of Health at the University of Melbourne, who are going to talk about their experiences um, with a very different approach to integrating an EMR. Over to you, Brian and Wendy. Thank you, Kathleen. Yeah. And even though we have the same last name and that's because we are husband and wife, <laughs> we haven't really chatted yet about how to do this together. I, um, the, we use the, the TEMR in um, Brian's class that he taught this semester. So maybe I'll let him introduce that class. Um, I used it in Utah for a couple of different classes, and then I think I'll give the um, the talk about about it since I really developed the materials. Well, thanks for the warning. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm teaching uh, Introduction to eHealth and Biomedical Informatics at the University of Melbourne, um, and just wrapped up the last term and I'm teaching a online one that starts on Monday, and we. We were basically going over a, a large curriculum kind of overhaul, um, and we basically just adopted the approach that Wendy had used in, in Utah for using the TEMR to uh, get basic introduction to what an EHR is like. So these are non-clinical students. We did have some uh, students that were nurses and physicians, but they were pursuing a, a computing and information systems degree. And we, uh, at least I introduced the, the use of the TMR as, as a way, uh, you know, I was thinking like they're going to be the future innovators. Okay, so what is this and how would we redesign it was my basic motivation in um, how we introduced it. We did use the EMR after we had gone over a history of medical documentation going back, you know, several centuries and um, talking about kind of the pros and cons of various um, approaches to documentation and what how the evolution of what documentation is used for prior to their uh, getting involved with the TEMR. So, Wendy? Okay. All right, so we have been using the Regan Streif uh, clinical learning platform, which is for short called the TEMR. And um, it has about 10,000 patients. They're real patients who've been de-identified and misidentified. It's uh, hosted on their server. And so we you log in to, to their website. Um, there are evaluation tools on the TEMR to be able to grade students' assignments within the TEMR. We haven't done that. And it built from, you know, this was their EMR that they had until they replaced it with Epic. So it is a, a real EMR that's been pivoted for teaching. So uh, I wanted to start up with right away with like, how do you get access to it? So we purchased the lowest level of membership, which is 15,000 US dollars a year, but um, they gave it to us for 7,000 and, and waived the setup for single sign on. Uh, with that, you get up to 150 student users, and then there's some fee-based support. So really, the, the main um, effort, I think, for them is to really set it up for us with single sign-on so that students can just use their university login. And then you can request you can request all the patients that they have or only a certain number. We only have four patients loaded in right now for the curriculum that we've created. So we developed this curriculum at the University of Utah. There were uh, a lot of us that worked together on this. Sorry. Just, just, just one second. <laughs> okay, the puppy. The puppy's big brother's at daycare, and I think he's sad. <laughs> um, so we developed this with as we tried to really create more of a flipped classroom model. Of um, and and so the activities are meant to be that, that they're laid out so that 
the assignments, they do things on their own at home. And then when they come together in person or online, then we put them in groups and they compare and discuss. So we, we developed one persona for a diabetes patient. Um, and then we have a, a lesson on a lab on, you know, learning how to use the TEMR, finding patient data, electronic medical record design, clinical decision support, and natural language processing. Although they don't have an NLP module in there, but it kind of demonstrates the need for one. So this is the persona, persona for William Parr, and he's got type 2 diabetes, and then we modified it a bit to be that he lives in Melbourne, although it's not that believable, probably, that there's a Hispanic man living in Castle, Maine. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's been suffering from lower back pain that's getting worse and so on. So, and this is based on the actual patient and what's in his record so that they kind of learn about the patient. Um, so the first lab is really, how do you find data, patient data in an EMR? And this is an eye opener for people, I think. So we just have this list of things that we uh, have them search for and put their, the value and where they found it. And then when they come together in a small group, you know, they say, you know, how much disagreement? Did you get the same values? Did you find it in the same places? Was it complete? Were you able to find it all? Um, what format was it in? What are the different formats of data? So we have a discussion about, about data format and there's always a lot of, um, everyone has this idea that there's one place for every data element in the EMR and that everyone would find it in that one place. And to see that the same thing is in different places and there's sometimes, they sometimes uh, disagree with each other is, is eye-opening. The second one then is about the design of the EMR. And so we want them to have firsthand experience like interacting as if they were a clinician. And so we follow the um, pneumonia care process model for uh, how do you take care of a patient when you think they have pneumonia. So they enter information into the EMR um, they look at the care process model and then they follow the advice and about placing orders. And so, for instance, they, you know, based on the guidelines that they're supposed to give this, you know, these prescriptions. And so they go in now and they order the medications. And it turns out that this patient is allergic or has an allergy in the EMR or um, penicillin. And so it's supposed to generate an alert. Uh, um, when they go to order it and then, you know, talk about the alert and how did that influence you? And then they go in and they have to write a soap note about what they did, you know, and, and so they read about soap notes and they input a note into the record. Then we have them, now that they've used the EMR, we have them do a usability test based and, you know, list all the things that they did, the tasks that they did and their evaluation and are there any heuristic or safety issues that would come about because of that. Um, so th that's an example of the types of assignments that we have in here. We have, like I said, there's four labs plus a training lab. Um, this is the link to the complete manual, which I, I'll put in the chat window. Uh, the, the decision support module, they go in and they create decision support rules for diabetes patients based on guidelines. And then, um, and then they, you know, make decisions like, is this going to be a pop-up or, or is it going to be uh, on the sidebar? And what color should you have it? And what words should you have here? And so they have a lot of discussion about alert fatigue and how to really design the best interventions. Wendy, let me just put in that we also have them uh, readings like the digital doctor uh, that go along with this. Uh, they're kind of reading about kind of real narrative descriptions about alert fatigues while they're generating things that will generate alert fatigue. Yeah, that's right. This is just the, the hands-on part, but they're, they're doing readings. Okay, so um, there are a lot of opportunities with the TEMR. Um, they have a back-end database that you could do querying for. They also have a population health um, you know, functionality, which we haven't used yet. And you, you can query and, and get back populations of patients and, and, and do, do population level things. So it's, it's underexplored on our part. Now, the TEMR has been used, is being used in a number of medical schools for medical school education. That's its main use. I think we're the first ones to really use it for informatics education. It's also being used in some nursing schools. And um, I think that you know, it's possible to have access to those materials that they've created. 
they do have it on their list to integrate it with Canvas, and that's high priority for our university. And so we might work, um, you know, work together with them on that. We'd like to create activities that are uh, more relevant for medical nursing and allied health students, and you know, make it a little more Australian-like uh, with its terminologies and and the such. Oh, I, I thought maybe I'd show you, give you a quick, like, where is it and how do you log on? So, okay, so you go to temr.regenstreet.org and we log in. So now it takes us to the University of Melbourne, single sign on. And so I sign on, let's hope this works. That's why I did slides in case, you know, the demo. Oh, shoot. So why did it fail? <laughs> oh, you know, I did change my login on a Oops. Oh. See, it's a good thing I did slides. Okay. Oh, now I got to go to my Google Authenticator. Um, Maybe while Wendy's looking that up, and I probably should have been the one to log in because I think I have more privileges on it than than Wendy does. So there's a um, there's a um, there's a you know a student view, there's an instructor view, and then there's an administrator view. And so, Wendy, if you go to population health tab, this is, um, this is where, like, as an instructor, you would search through the 13,000 patients and, I, and find, so you, you, you do queries to identify uh, patients that have uh, conditions or findings that you're interested in. And then these patients get added to your clinic and the clinic is what the, um, the students see. And um, then there's, I don't see what, you're not seeing the rule based. Um, it, maybe that's, that's a different location. Um, but it, it found you know, 12,000 patients with diabetes. Is that right? Anyway. Oh, maybe no, that's, that's, the total, that's the total population. The patient that matched your criteria are 1,600. Um, now, in terms of curriculum, like kind of making this, they do have, like Wendy said, they have the ability to make modules that are embedded in the TEMR, but they have to create those modules themselves at uh, Regan Street. And so they don't really view that as scalable. So the approach that they're kind of pushing is that the TEMR gets launched from a Canvas instance or a, you know, an LMS instance, and the, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the kind of teaching elements and the evaluation elements are embedded in your LMS. Uh, one thing that I think that is kind of a useful thing that you can see the students, uh, of how the students have used it, is you can look at each student if you went over to the I think instructor toolkit, and you can see every page click that they made on the uh, EMR on how much time they spent on each page. And so if you really wanted to assess how the students were doing information searching, you know, or retrieval and evaluate their, um, their, their strategies, et cetera, th those uh, page clicks and page views are all stored in the, um, in the TEMR. Yeah. And, and you can see, I mean, it was an EMR, so you can go through and you can order, and then you can talk about the, you know, anyway. anyway and one of, the, one of the things when we talked about making this Australian um, kind of flavored is the, the most important thing we need to do is get a hold of a Australian drug formulary and so that that can be um, added to their, their database so that when you are doing um, order entry, uh, it's a more realistic set of um, drug choices that you're you're choosing from. All right, how much time we have some time for questions, I think. Take over the chat window. Yep.
Um, okay, Wendy. Yeah. So I think we do. We've got about five minutes. So you, you and Brian, if you're happy to field a few. Um, there was a few, a couple of comments. Obviously, Chris made the comment, the, the in, example of simple information um, being a really great starting point and, and, and using that um, with everything that flows on from it. Um, so an uh, opportunity to teach usability, clinical safety, governance, uh, et cetera. Um, yes, uh, Tina, thanks for your question. I, I saw that Tina posted a question about um, US drug formulations, but you, um, you answered that already. So there was a couple. I hadn't of seen it. I had not seen that question yet. So I just, I just thought. <laughs> no, so you, you organically answered that, I think. Um, so and it is, it is a simple. It's just a drop in of those uh, formularies into their database. So it's not a major, um, yeah, any sort of change on their point of view. We just need to get an, an available uh, formulary to pass on to them. Wonderful, um, uh, Wendy and or Brian. I, I guess uh, question also. Um, uh, any feedback that students have given about this kind of learning experience? Probably for you, Brian. Um, did the students have anything to say about it thus far? Well, you know, um, probably better. I think in, in Utah, when we had more opportunity for feedback of the, all the disruption with, you know, COVID-19 this semester, I think we didn't, um, you know, do formal feedback on this. And we, we probably should have. Um, I think it was very popular for the students in Utah to actually do, you know, something, you know, kind of real hands-on. Um, I have some uh, kind of materials to go, like, supplement this. I use the Mimic uh, ICU data set out of MIT and uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital, which is a, a data mart of ICU data. And I just wrapped up a week of uh, doing data, data analysis of that with... Um, first year medical students and they just loved it. You know, just having real hands-on explore. Um, I, you know, I, th I, I think that, that that's the, the, the realness and kind of the, the realness of the data, I think has been something that people have really appreciated. Okay. So yeah, obviously a real, real world experience. Yeah, um, and since this was, you know, all online and people are just not very interactive online. <laughs> but the few people that did make comments just found it very informative and, um, and surprising. Yeah, we did have a tutor say it was the best lecture they'd had. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Kathleen's kindly shared a uh, link to, to the Mimic data set there. So thank you for that, Kathleen. Um, perhaps quick, uh, one last question. It actually was from Kathleen. Um, might flick to you, Brian, um, was whether Regan Streif, uh, I don't know if you you know, possibility, I think it's just throwing it out there, whether Regan Streif might be open to a discount on a larger collective licensing agreement, um, you know, i.e. a multi-university license or something. So that's just something um, to think about, I think. Um, I think they would be. Yeah. yeah. Especially they want it to be useful. Yeah. Yeah, a, a, lot of, um, a lot of the charge that they have in there is to help design materials. And so that's why we got a discount is they're not designing our materials, we're designing our own. You're doing it for them, yeah. And so, and we're also an entree into informatics students, which nobody else is doing. So, and we're making all our materials available widely. Wonderful. So they're definitely, definitely, they're really great to work with. Well, Kathleen, but I'm the not time lag is difficult sometimes. The, yeah, the, awesome. I think that the biggest um, kind of pr uh, problem is the, we identify patients that to add to the clinic, but the people at, Regan Street actually have to do the transfer of the students that we've identified, the patients we've identified um, in the population health query to our clinic. And so um, that, that's, that was the bit, biggest bottleneck I've run across as I've tried to come up with um, new scenarios. And as I work with the, the medical school here at Melbourne, is just kind of this, you end up with kind of a couple of day lag between I've identified something, I need something to get executed. And, you know, I email it, it's the, they've already gone home for the day and then blah, 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 blah. I'll flip back to you, Kathleen, I think. Uh, you're, you're on mute, Kathleen. Hear me now? Yep, there better? we go. Okay, okay we're right. back. Plugged in. Um, thanks very much, Wendy and Brian, for sharing the resource and your experiences as, as they are actually unfolding here. And I think an interesting connection to make between Stephen's presentation and yours is that match between what seems like a good practical experience 
to simulate with the tool and what the the professional codes of practice and curriculum standards require and i think that's a piece of work that we're all interested to to progress so how does the experience of playing in the temr map onto what say a physiotherapy graduate or a midwifery graduate might need to demonstrate in practice. So let's come back to that later. And um, I would like now to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Serena Tompkins is in the School of Health Sciences at the University of Melbourne and has been leading an integrated electronic medical record project across that school for a couple of years now. So Serena, are you ready to tell us about what you've been doing? Yes, thank you, Kathleen. Um, I'm going to go and start sharing my screen if I can. Let's have a look. Okay. All right, so I'm hoping that you can all um, see my screen at this point. Now, um, I think a lot of what I'm going to talk about today very much links to what Stephen Guinea actually um, very much beautifully highlighted earlier um, this morning. But basically, um, before I start all that, um, one of the things that I would like to do is to um, acknowledge the um, traditional owners on this land. So I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work. And I gratefully acknowledge the vibrant living cultures and knowledge systems. I pay respect to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to all indigenous, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here with us today. So um, Wendy a few minutes ago um, pointed out that we should say something about ourselves. So I quickly uh, put this slide together. So I am a course coordinator for the Master of Nursing Science program. This is a two year program, which um, is five semesters long, um, very intense program where people from various education backgrounds um, transition into nursing practice. It is an entry to practice program, which means that people start um, from the very beginning um, of the nursing profession. So they do a graduate year and then move on to their postgraduate qualifications in that space. Um, my um, lecturing at the university is very much in between physiology and health sciences because in my past life, I was also a cell biologist. So um, in addition to being an academic, I am a clinical researcher uh, with um, the plastic and maxillofacial um, surgery department where I look at research in vascular anomalies um, and in the past um, I was a clinical nurse consultant in that space. So my relationship with EMR is very much through research but also clinical practice in um, outpatients um, clinic. With the um, Royal Children's Hospital, I also work with the nursing research department looking at education research and workforce development um, very much in digital health space. So our approach to um, EMR, which is probably the major dominant factor that our students encounter very early on, was a very simple one. Uh, we recognized um, particularly um, that technologies evolve rapidly. Uh, we also recognized that the students' first encounter with these digital health technologies wasn't actually in a classroom at our university, but rather when they uh, went to their clinical placement. And what that meant is that when the student was actually at the bedside, instead of focusing on learning clinical skills and developing communication strategies with the patient, they were actually busy trying to figure out how to use a system that is at the bedside. So that's failing in terms of, um, you know, um, expanding the clinical practice, learning more and consolidating that as expected uh, from them in terms of um, clinical education. So um, because we knew that they weren't trained to manage this technology, obviously we needed to change this, but more importantly, we needed to change the fear that was actually coming through, um, through this interaction very early on. One thing that is very fortunate for our university is that um, nearly 100% of our students will actually end up being in Parkville Precinct. And many of you might be aware that Parkville Precinct is running on EPIC, meaning that at some point during those two years of education, the students will encounter EMR. Thus, in some way, they will actually gain that knowledge through the training at the hospital to an extent. 
However, what we do notice is that there is a discord uh, between what's actually expected of students in this space and how they actually develop their capabilities in digital health technology space. And so, of course, you know, on the left here, you've got mobile devices and in, um, interaction between a health clinician and a potential patient. And then you've got something um, like you see here in a Bendigo advertiser where, a, you know, a, a nurse is still using a paper clip and a chart in order to actually um, do the COVID-19 screening, leading us to a question of, you know, where is this, um, how, how useful is this to the students considering the fact that they see one expectation and in reality there's something else. And this links back to, um, to Steve's earlier point about needing to have a, um, a hybrid model where you still teach paper format as well as the digital format. Uh, but more importantly for us, this is coming down to what we refer to as a fixed um, or uh, sorry, rather broken pipeline, which means that if the health technology is advancing in clinical settings and it's doing more in terms of patient care, we are producing a workforce that is actually not capable or not agile in order to be able to master these technologies. So for us to fix this broken pipeline, we need to think of something that is relatively pragmatic, straightforward for implementation. And it doesn't increase a, a, a burden on the student, both in terms of um, academic performance, in other words, more assessments, but also in terms of cognitive load, because when you talk to students, they're there to do nursing. And if you mention digital health um, and you don't frame it correctly, they tend to shut down at this particular point. So what we knew um, before we started this project is that, you know, we're having increasing number of national informatics standards that are being generated for nurses in allied health. We also know what our accrediting bodies need. So the Australian Nursing and Midwifery Foundation um, Council, and the, of course, um, Nurses in the Free Board of Australia in our case. And we also know that um, in order for students to actually manage uh, what the future brings, they need to be competent in informatics skills and efficient use of health information technology. The question is, what do you teach them when your curriculum is overloaded and when you are actually trying to gently replace the old learning objectives with the new ones without, again, causing that further burden? So in 2019, um, we were very fortunate to receive um, a learning and teaching grant which actually allowed us to develop a curriculum around this space um, where we were actually preparing, aiming to prepare the nursing and allied health staff to use EMR to again collect the data but also to effectively communicate with the patient in the presence of that technology. Um, and more importantly, um, the idea is that once they do this module, it would be possible then to have um, simulation uh, across the program so that they can then increase this EMR uh, knowledge and how the data is created and used to be able to um, make evidence-based clinical decisions. Now, in order to actually do this, uh, we sat down with all our professions um, that are within the School of Health Sciences. So we've had um, nursing, physiotherapy, optometry, speech pathology, audiology and social work. And we actually started off with a simple thing, which is what is our process, clinical process when it comes down to managing patients. So we were looking in terms of, you know, data gathered, so that's our patient assessment, data entered, that's our documentation of what we've actually just assessed. You know, where do we put that data? Is it a paper record or is it some kind of a database? How do we communicate that data to our colleagues, whether they're other nurses or other allied health professionals or medical doctors, it doesn't really matter. And then of course, what is that data used in the end? So there is the two components, one is the research, and then the other one is the evidence-based practice in terms of sharing data to bring better models of care. In addition to all these members, we also had a member from equity and diversity um, department or team rather, who oversaw the development of all the case studies that are going to be working in this space. Our next model to build into is to actually um, make sure that all our curriculum was very much based on person-centered holistic care so that the students actually had um, a very strong focus um, and uh, that would be leading to desired graduate outcomes. Now, in terms of how this would be delivered is that you would have your theoretical simulated and real life components, so that's the clinical practice, to be able to utilize it as a framework for practice across the two year program. Now, just around this time, as we were discussing what to teach in this space and how do we pull all this together, there was a really lovely Delphi study that came out with Pontefract and Wilson in the uh, BMC Medical Education, the 
actually outlined the themes quite well that aligned with what we were hoping to do. So in this diagram here, you can actually see, for example, that there is a whole um, range of subdomains that can be um, taught in a data communication sense, what we should be looking in terms of teaching them and generating data, and how do you actually then map this across the um, entire curriculum. The important thing about this particular module is that it's actually embedded within a major subject. So for us, for example, it will be sitting in the very first subject called Nursing Assessment and Care, with students for the first time coming to the simulation lab, they're learning about the clinical skills that they need to do when they're assessing a patient. And then at the same time, they would be introduced to the actual technology at the, at the same site, so they can learn to work with that, in, with that presence from the very beginning. Thus taking away that alienation of what do I do if I've got a computer here and a patient here, what's, what, what is the perfect setup in this sense? And so in the end, um, through all these discussions and of course looking through the literature, we came to the six topics that the online module would be covering. The very first one is of course person-centered care in the age of digital technology and then the introduction to the EMR software. And our EMR software is very much linking to uh, what Wendy and Brian had mentioned earlier, so the registry will be employed. Then teaching students about accessing data, you know, how do they access and interpret it, um, how do they inform the clinical decision that they're going to make, and then of course um, looking at how do they collect the patient data and enter it into the EMR rather than EHR. Um, a lot of emphasis is being put over the communicating data, um, looking at interdisciplinary communication with key stakeholders, and um, as Stephen mentioned earlier, when we come down to the interprofessional education, we're not necessarily looking at synchronous delivery. We are looking at asynchronous. And I'll explain that model in, in a slide more um, detail later on. Um, but the idea would be that you actually teach the students at the same time um, in how they manage each other's data, how do they trust each other in terms of what that clinical process was and using um, that particular information as a reliable information to then look at their own um, practice. And then in the very end, we are looking at using the EHR or EMI as a research tool, um, auditing and safety of healthcare quality and nature being our specific domains. So how would that actually run? So if um, the way we envisioned this is that you would have a loop so that, for example, a nursing student would come and meet a patient that's already been admitted um, into the clinic. They would perform their assessment, um, enter their data, and then they would actually have to go and look at any other notes that might exist there that have been entered by a medical clinician or by a physiotherapist or social work, et cetera. And this is possible because the case studies that have been developed earlier have been developed through multidisciplinary input. So if you look at the overall description of a case study, there will be a basic history there. And then each person from each discipline has come along and added a component to it. And thus, when you create your assessment tasks, you can ask a student, in nursing, for example, whether or not they would make a referral to social work, why would they make that referral, and what do they expect in terms of the outcome for that referral. Similar thing would occur if a physiotherapy student has entered that data. In return, for other disciplines, it would be expected to do the same. So if they're coming on a morning shift, for example, a physiotherapy student who needs to see a patient that morning can look at the um, overnight um, notes from the nursing staff um, to decide you know whether there's been any changes since the day before etc or even to get to know the patient from the nursing perspective and then be able to um, deliver the care that they need to or make the decisions that they need to. Overall what we're really aiming to do with this is to again remove that um, lack of familiarity with the technology to remove the fear of having um, digital technology in the presence of a patient and to empower the student to focus on clinical care, person-centered care, whilst being uh, mindful that there is a technology in the room. So um, this is basically what we are aiming to do um, and that's probably where I'll stop. Um, the subject is starting in um, January 2021, so I think for us there'll be quite a few evaluations to look into. Back to you. Thank you, Zarina. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, obviously, I've got lots of context, but for many of the other uh, participants, it was really great for them to, um, to hear. Um, there was a couple of questions while you were talking. I guess the first one might go back to the start of your presentation, um, which was in a digital society or digital world, where do you think some of the, um, some of the fear around using this technology comes from? I think um, 
when we spoke to us, so what we actually did before we started discussing this is we actually called a group of students who already been in a first clinical placement where they encountered the EMR and that was at the children's hospital. And what their um, issue or the fear was at that time is that there is this machine that they're just learning to get to know how to use. They don't understand the power of it, where it's going, what it's doing. And then there is the, the care that they need to learn and that this you know, patient focus that needs to be present. So I think the fear is that uh, the interesting component that constitutes that fear is that people think that if they focus on the computer and entering data and doing stuff, that they're not being good nurses, they're not, they, they're not delivering good care. And so it is an issue of trying, again, to remove that fear of, um, or rather, from our perspective, it's probably lack of familiarity or the fact that the computer is there, because at, up to this point in time, we haven't had a machine in a simulation lab, so they can actually come and, and you know, play with it and, and learn to communicate with the patient at the same time. We haven't taught them about the strategic positioning of where the computer should be as you're trying to talk to the patient. So all those things actually need to be addressed if we are to maintain person-centered care. So students have this huge focus on person-centered care, and suddenly their attention is you know, taken over by the computer. And so in their mind, is, am I still delivering person-centred care if I'm trying to do all these things? So I think that there's another question from Kathleen that flows on uh, very nicely from that, which was some of the research suggesting that um, EMI use can be a barrier to patient practitioner communication, um, et cetera, yeah. um, and, and how you might consider uh, addressing the risk of that uh, within the pedagogy. So we actually have a heavy focus on clinical communication within the program. And so what we are doing at the moment is, again, simply introducing strategic positioning of the digital technology within um, a patient room because we've got the simulations to do so. Um, and the idea there would be that we actually um, have a peer reviewed feedback where a student is acting as a patient, another student is acting as a nurse while they're trying to enter data. And for them to actually feed off each other what it feels like to be on the receiving end and, and the giving end and then um, reversing those roles. Um, EMR can be a, a barrier to patient communication for, um, from our perspective from, from two, from two uh, reasons. One is the fact that people are so heavily focused on it without uh, making their rapport with the patient. And the second thing is that um, patients themselves may feel alienated from that technology. So what we teach students is that if they are entering data into the computer, to turn towards the patient and actually um, talk to them about what they're doing, rather than the patient thinking, for example, as we've had one student report, that they are Googling and playing with their phone rather than actually entering the data as they are collecting it from the patient. And there's one last question here uh, from Chris. And Chris, I might actually ask you, Chris Bain, that is, I might ask you to just elaborate on this a little bit more for me uh, in case I lose the context of this. Um, uh, Zarina, can you elaborate a little bit more about uh, using Epic itself uh, in teaching the students? Um, so it's the info source for these tasks. Um, I'm not sure if I've captured that correct. Um, Chris, feel free to jump in if I haven't. Uh, that, that's right. Mark. Just understand. Just trying to understand the relationship of Epic or whatever other systems in the different hospitals to these tasks and the and the overview framework. Thanks, Chris. So I'm actually going to be um, probably going against the grain here when I say that we see EMR tool, uh, EMR as a tool. So it doesn't matter whether it's Epic or Cerna or Regan Street or whatever. Completely agree. What, <laughs> yeah, so what we are actually focusing on is good practice and good guidelines. And so um, we did try talking to Epic prior to Wendy and Brian joining us because we felt that since they are in part recent and they actually have an education based um, platform that is used currently to train the staff of the children's and elsewhere that it would be possible to actually organize a simulation whereby you could log in into that system and then run simulation for example at Melbourne in the simulation lab using real-time um, real-life data etc etc and so um, their response at that time was that you know thanks very much, but we're focusing on, on the hospitals. We don't quite see the impact um, that we could make in terms of um, student education. So we never got anywhere with that particular discussion. Plus the fact that they, they, they estimated that it would cost us about $100,000 a year to run this particular type of simulation by entering EPIC through children's um, servers. So of course that's not sustainable. You know, nursing schools don't make money. So um, you know, you can't go down that track. But again, going back to my earlier point, um, I don't really think that it matters uh, which tool you use. What matters is the case study, the quality of the case study, 
having a real life simulation that you enable the student to teach um, patient assessment and to use technology at the same time. And also removing that potential of student feeling burnt out because they're actually trying to manage both things at the same time as they're learning to be nurses or so allied health professionals. I might just, just say something, Mark, to, maybe just a placeholder, Mark. I think there's something I could say at the end. Yep, I'll make it up. The relationship with EHR vendors in this space. Serena, I guess part of my question more was though, irrespective of the system, agree with you, are they actually going to the real system to complete these tasks? Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, Thank that's you. right. We're yeah. heading to Regan Strafe, which what Ben and Brian were in, um, implemented within the university. Initially, we were going to use MD Connect, which is the medical school um, in, in-house program, which is actually quite well suited for what we need to do, because what we are doing is teaching students to enter data, teaching students to review their notes, to make referrals. So they're really basic processes rather than advanced health informatic um, technology, or sorry, um, uh, practice. So for us, it's really, um, you know, providing them with the basic skills to be able to then step into this field. So if they feel inspired down the track to, you know, pursue health informatics, we've opened that door for them. That's great. Thank you all. Uh, Chris, I've made a placeholder for that uh, at the end. So thanks for that. Uh, Kathleen, I'll flick back to you. Thank you, Zarina. My pleasure. Yes, thanks very much, Serena. That was terrific. And I think really meeting our objectives today and giving some insights into how people actually can practically get from the notion of a tool to, to curriculum and, and relating that to the real experiences that you're sending your students out on placement for. Um, now, at this point, I'd like to segue to um, our colleagues from the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at Monash University, Mr. Stephen Walker and Professor Tina Brook, who are going to tell us about their experiences. And I know nothing about these, so I'm very interested to hear what you're doing and how it's working. So Excellent. thanks very much, Stephen and Tina. Now, are you happy to share your slides from your laptop? Yeah, so what, I might share okay. the slides and That's Tina might kick us off um, yes. to begin with. So uh, hopefully that is sharing with everyone. And I don't think Stephen was online when um, Brian and Wendy were talking, so he may not get this joke, but although we are pre presenting as a pair, we're not married. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> so thanks everybody for um, having us today. I'm going to just talk generally and and then have Stephen talk about our implementation. I will say the most important thing I have found in in this process is having a strong clinician educator champion um, is the only way to make it work and Stephen Walker is a strong clinician educator champion. So I'm a pharmacist by training um, and you're, you'll now hear another uh, regional accent from the US on the <laughs> on the uh, the call and I'm a survivor of several EMR um, transitions in the US as well as transition in the education systems to learning management systems which don't sound new at all now but essentially are the electronic health record of education and um, came to Monash four years ago to implement a new course and one of the aspects of that court that pharmacy course was more time spent on clinical placement than had previously been happening and what what we were running into was uh, sites who sort of thought pharmacy students were more of a burden in the teaching space versus could be extenders and could could actually help um, contribute to the care model uh, completely by uh, it, when I was formerly at University of California at San Francisco and we did a major EMR um, implementation there, we actually just had to use students as part of the implementation. And so I was familiar with if we can get these students skilled up, then when they go out into the placement sites, they actually can be ambassadors and help with some of that fear of change and everything if they have learned in this way. So a strong motivator for me was to help them, um, you know, to, to take the therapeutic reasoning that we had been teaching through paper-based or learning management system-based cases to help them learn a different way of clinical and therapeutic reasoning and that they could go out and be very supportive in sites where that were go undergoing through that process. Also around the time I got here was my health record was starting and I, all the brouhaha around that. And from a community pharmacy perspective, I was really keen to have pharmacy students who 
could help guide patients through some of their concerns and fears in that space. Monash Faculty of Pharmacy has developed their own uh, teaching dispensing system. It's called My Dispense. I put the link there. And uh, we developed this here in-house and have been using it for about 10 years. And we share it freely with schools all over the world. There's about 100 um, pharmacy programs across the world that use this platform for free. We, we were on an international webinar earlier this week and there were 500 um, novice and advanced users on that as well. So we knew that it is possible to develop your own thing. However, we're very small faculty and we, we also knew we probably couldn't do it better than anyone else quickly. Uh, we had an acute care unit with a great clinician educator called Stephen Walker who was um, ready to go. And so we did choose an off the shelf product that's um, primarily US used, about, used by about two thirds of the uh, pharmacy training programs in the US um, and adapted it for Australian use. Well, let me see if there's anything else that I wanted to say. Yeah, I, I, I really, um, Stephen talked, uh, the other Stephen, talked about uh, the Trojan horse approach, and um, I totally get that. We were really lucky because we were building a new course. I was like, we need to get this in before, um, before somebody else takes the space. Um, and then from the interprofessional side, and Chris may have shared this, I got on the call just a slightly late, um, really hearing what Serena said about what uh, what we had built was a collaborative care curriculum first across medicine, pharmacy, nursing, dentistry, physio, everyone else, and then put the digital health curriculum embedded it within that. And that's the website where you can find both the collaborative care curriculum and the link to the digital health curriculum. So I'm talking really fast because I really want you to hear from Stephen, but I'm happy to answer any questions along the way. So thanks, guys. Uh, thanks, Tina. So yeah, we, we were talking about um, the implementation of an existing product, EHR Go, um, into pharmacy education. And as Tina was saying, we tried to use it in an acute care unit. So I was the unit coordinator for that. Acute care being really like hospital based focus. So we're really talking about uh, electronic medical records. I know it says EHR, but it's really electronic medical records that we're dealing with. So I'll go through the setup. I'll go through what the um, student experience is like, and then our, I guess our future uses. So in terms of the setup, I'm sure everyone on this call is aware of all this, but um, essentially our students, as Tina was mentioning, we teach them sort of a standardized process of patient-centered care. And we often would give them PDF or give them physical copies of drug charts, clinical notes, admission notes, OBS charts, et cetera. And I'm sure people are familiar with these sorts of notes that exist um, in current practice. But in reality, um, and um, I'm a pharmacist, I work at the Austin Hospital. That's not what I see anymore. Um, I see electronic medical records and even more and more, the students are walking into placement sites that are using EMRs, um, so they need to be ready for that. So EMRs being systems that are used within a single healthcare organization. So this is an example of CERNA. I know that um, Zarina was mentioning Epi, but um, CERNA is what we use at the Austin. And this is certainly something that I, I see. So we wanted to simulate the experience and prepare them for that a bit more when they went on the experiential. So um, to give a bit of background to EHR Go, it's a web-based third-party vendor that's um, produced by Archetype Innovations in um, the United States. Um, as Tina mentioned, it's widely used at pharmacy schools and medical schools um, and nursing schools within, a, within America, but we're the first to use it within Australia. And it really does target not only pharmacy, but some of the other um, fields within the healthcare industry. So really why we went down the process of, um, of using EHR Go, essentially one of the guiding principles that we use is this, um, this is great review from Wilbanks at all talking about the use of EMR simulation in education. And it goes through, these are the sort of key features of an ideal education simulation program. And you can see from the graphics here that most of it was compliant with what EHR Go was offering and some of it was adaptable. So really you need a good graphical interface. Uh, the data needs to be logically ordered in menus as it is in EMR systems that exist. There needs to be a readily available instructional material and handbook. And in fact, they have um, video materials of how to use it for both students and, and staff. 
it needs to be easy for the course instructor to be able to create patient cases, which certainly it was quite easy to create those um, cases and to adapt them to fit our learning outcomes. Uh, it needs to contain a library of different cases. So there were there was over 100 pre-existing cases that are there. Um, there's a system that EHR Go offers where you can actually share cases with um, other faculties if you wish. Um, and uh, it's certainly like a big bank of sort of a community of practice there. Interestingly enough, and I think this is sort of similar to what Zarina was talking about, we went down to the process of why don't we talk to Cerner or why don't we talk to Epic and surely they've got some sort of education program and we met with the same sort of, that's nice, but we're not going to do that at the moment. And really interestingly, the functionality of these simulation systems don't have to be the same as the clinical EHRs. And in fact, I think, well, I was even close to be able to use a Cerner product, but it was just going to become really clunky to use from an educational perspective. Um, and it was, I think really, that's what I, my advice would be that these sort of simulation systems, it's teaching the concept of using the actual system rather than teaching the nuances of click this button, click that button, that stuff they can learn when they're on their placement. It's more about how to engage with it and to continue that patient centered care whilst having a simulation, uh, whilst having an EMR product available to you. Um, dynamic systems are more beneficial, so whereby the student can contribute information and um, that can be shared with others within their team and that's certainly something you can do in EHR Go. And um, the good thing about EHR Go is that it does facilitate the release of information over time. So you can build simulations whereby the person deteriorates and then this happens and then this happens and then this happens. So that there are ways that you can do that in that system. Ultimately, it'd be good if you could have an audit trail log of student activities, which that does exist, but really the, um, the audit of what the student is doing with the system is retained by the team at EHR Go from an instructor end. I can see that they've created their account and that they've actually accessed the task I told them to do, but I can't really see more than that. So that's something that's potentially adaptable if you ask the team, but not readily available. And I believe they're working on being able to transition the product so that you can use it over mobile phones and tablets, but currently the interface doesn't look as well in those systems. Some of the other advantages were that it's got 24 hour um, technical support and that's really a key. I would recommend anyone going down the process of using you know, um, simulation systems as that's crucial because things change and you need to um, pivot quickly. Uh, it had existing case material. We had existing experience with some of our partner schools internationally. And so we had a good community of practice and we were able to sort of talk to each other about, I did this, what'd you do with this? How'd you fix this? So that was really useful. Academic staff have free access to EHR Go. I've got a lot of uh, pharmacists who are building cases for me and they don't work on site. So it was great that they were able to do it remotely. And especially now where we're in COVID situations, um, you know, that's really great that they're able to access that freely um, and I can just invite them to, to be involved in updating that material. There is sometimes a bit of a time lag and I guess that is to do with sort of network constraints. Um, we're, we're talking with the EHR Go team about that. So it was a little bit slow, I guess, at times and that was a bit of a disadvantage. Um, the pathology units and date conventions. So currently it's a largely Americanized system. So for example, things like 1st of December is presented as 12 slash 1 slash 19. And you could appreciate that can be a bit of a, there had to be a bit of a communication piece to students about this is what this means. Um, so that was a bit of a, uh, a bit of a frustrating workaround to some degree. Um, but now that we're engaging more with this system, they're going to change it so that we can um, uh, have it a bit more Australianized at times as well. There is a cost, it is an external product, it's not built in house, so there's a cost associated with that, um, and that can become higher certainly when you have a higher um, student load. Um, so that's certainly a barrier to, or something to consider. Case building time also. Um, it's perhaps not as easy as just writing something down and, and scanning it and, and sending it to your students. There is a bit of, um, you need to use the system. 
So in terms of setting up, we had to go through a process of customizing the materials, sending them our Australian products, and they, the team were able to do that very quickly. Having an external team do that for you was really great, um, rather than doing it from scratch yourself. We were able to adapt some of our pathology results. I was able to give them, these are the clinical notes I want the students to be able to access. This is what I see in practice. Can you replicate this? And they were really good at doing that. And um, at times, um, fixing some of those date conventions. Privacy and data protection agreements was a, uh, an interesting barrier for our faculty. I'm sure that's something that others might come across. This is a third party vendor. The data is stored within America. So that brings its own challenges. And if you're going down this sort of path, I would really recommend that you, um, you get onto that early because it can be quite challenging to look through those agreements, even though this is a very low risk. Obviously there's staff and train, um, student training that needs to be involved, so building guidelines, videos. Um, EHR Go actually offered teleconferences for our staff via Zoom, uh, where they walk them through how to build cases, which is great. In terms of case building, it takes about four hours per case, um, two hours for a simple case on average. I guess that would be my other thing, a lesson for those who are going down this system is, um, oftentimes I have to tell the people who build cases is, do I really, does the patient really need to be in hospital for 15 days when they had a penicillin allergy? Is that really important for the storyline? Because I don't want to have to build 15 days worth of content if it really we could have got that storyline in, in one day. So that's something I would, I would think about. Again, it's about those concepts and those teaching rather than necessarily um, being an exact replica of what the system looks like. So from a student experience end, this is sort of what it um, looks like. It's ordered logically. You can go through your vitals, your, your orders, um, your meds, your pathology results, etc. cetera. Um, I believe that orders are listed more in an epic style in that um, you've got it more in a sort of a, a list order rather than a tile order. Um, certainly the students were able to look at things like vitals. They were able to look at admission notes. Um, they were able to look at labs and they were able to graph some of those labs and um, they certainly were able to review those documents. They were to, you were able to administer medications. This is for predominantly for pharmacy students, but in terms of our nursing students, that would be beneficial from that end, including um, there's a functionality where you can use barcode scanning um, to, to make sure you've got the right patient and the right product. The students can document clinical interventions into the system. So it's dynamic in that sense and they can contribute to that. So they contribute notes of screening. Uh, you can use it in primary care and acute care settings. You can have individual or team access. So individual meaning you see your encounter, teams meaning that everyone in your team seems the same encounter. So that really has benefits in terms of interprofessional education whereby a medical student as part of the team could contribute their notes and then a pharmacy student would be able to see that it actually alerts to you that someone's contributed a new note you refresh your system and you can then say okay based on that note i'm going to act in this way so it really lends towards that interprofessional education style you can use it for both formative and summative activities that's certainly what we did for 2019 we had 33 different cases that we built um, for that that um, 12 week semester. This is just an example of some of the students working in teams. It's certainly before the COVID times, if only we could do this now. Um, and students are sort of using the big screen to access the material and work together and um, populate their, their clinical notes. When we surveyed the students, um, one of the things we asked them is, did you we think that practicing information gathering was important? Um, I've got about a 209 students in my cohort, so this is about 81% respondent. Um, and in our free text situation, they were often making comments about how it prepared them for their hospital placement. So we did this after they came back from placement. Um, and a lot of the comments were on this theme of, it really helped me prepare for my hospital placement at X hospital, because they were using EMR. It's a similar interface. I didn't feel overwhelmed when I was in that experience. So I think that Regardless of what product you use, I think it's definitely important that we go down this path of simulating that experience and preparing them for their experientials. It gives you that safe space that they can, um, you know, they can learn about those processes before they go on the, to their placements. 
when we asked them to list down one lesson they learned from information gathering from those EHR Go, um, the three major three themes that came out from that when we did a thematic analysis was the importance of robust information gathering. So a lot of the students were commenting that it's easy to miss key pieces of information. You really need to look at every bit of detail that's in there. Um, you need to access and understand all the information together and formulate uh, a recommendation, which is certainly that that's the way it is in the electronic medical record system. And for them to engage with that um, in a safe simulated environment before placement was um, beneficial for them to learn that. Others, the other major theme was students were talking about um, efficiency of information gathering. So having a bit of a systematic approach. So a lot of the times they were also commenting like, I would start with the admission note first to see what the patient came in for. Then I would go to the, the meds chart. Then I would go to the labs and the vitals. So them developing that system even before they go on placement, I think has, has got that value. And then there were other students who were, you know, were, were having a bit of a negative response, I guess, is saying that it was hard to put things together. I wish we went through the other process where you just gave us the PDFs with everything on the one document which I think that, you know, that's obviously a student gripe, but um, I think even that is telling in itself that, yes, we would love to have all the information all together in one bit, but that's not the reality of the healthcare system that we're working in. There's hybrid systems, there's paper charts, there's um, digital charts. And I think them learning the fact that they need to piece all these things together, I think that's an important lesson um, for them to have. So I guess in terms of future uses, um, we're hoping to use it a bit more dynamically where students are contributing to that. We're adding more detail in real time. Certainly we wanna lend more to interprofessional education. So we're going through a process now for this next semester whereby faculty of nursing and medicine are actually gonna be adopting it and looking at ways that we can integrate between our campuses uh, with an inter-campus license or inter-faculty licenses. We want to sort of use my health record more. So it's not geared to my health record is an American system. So we want to integrate that a little bit more seamlessly in future uses and certainly see how multi-system simulations can tie in with each other. So Tina mentioned earlier on about my dispense, which is our in-house dispensing simulation program. And we definitely want to see how that seamlessly can um, integrate with the EMR system, EHR Go. So they were the main things that I wanted to talk about today. And I'm happy to um, look at some questions on the chat. Yeah, thanks very much, Stephen and Tina. Fantastically interesting what you've been doing. Um, and you know, just to learn about all the angles that you've considered here. Um, there's a lot of hard won experience behind this session, I can tell. Um, because we're running quite close to time, um, I'll leave Stephen and Tina to respond in the chat window and we may come back to this in, at the end of today's session. But yep. in order that we keep to time, I'd like now to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ben Barry, who is in the School of Clinical Medicine at University of Queensland. He's been working with CSIRO there's an acronym in his, the title of his talk that some people may not be familiar with, Fast Health Interoperability Resources, or FIRE. Um, and Ben, are you ready to share your screen with us? I am indeed. Thanks, Kappa. Thanks very much. Off you go. Okay. Just... Um... Oh, Stephen may need to unshare. Okay, so thanks very much, uh, Kathleen, Stephen, and Chris for having me along today. And look, this this work that I'll uh, go through is is um, is, is very much uh, grounded in the expertise of the Australian e Health Research Centre of CSIRO, and uh, the the key folk there have been David Hanson, their CEO, Jim Steele, one of their lead uh, programmers and developers, and and then a, a collaboration that commenced uh, between us and UQ Medicine and uh, Professor Mark Bronstein from the United States and CSIRO back in 2018. I'm an uh, allied health background myself, but, but have a key role in teaching in the UQ Med program. And uh, the context we're operating in is 
looking at ways to, to try and uh, support our student cohort, about 450 students in each year, uh, to enhance their skills in digital health and clinical informatics without, as you're all encountering, uh, the, the issue of trying to get things into already very, very full curricula. Uh, a few other key folk there are, are part of a teaching innovation grant that we've uh, acquired this year. And the project is working across uh, CSIRO, Faculty of Medicine. Uh, from the absolute outset of this project, it's involved the Faculty of Engineering, Architecture and Information Technology, uh, with IT students actually developing the, the prototype version of the platform uh, in collaboration with CSIRO and Medicine. And more recently, we've recruited nursing, pharmacy and physiotherapy with our our strong hope to extend it to the other disciplines. And it's been fascinating to hear of the, the work uh, that uh, a number of you are doing in that space. As I mentioned, our intent is to, to try and uh, support our existing tutorials. And in medicine, we have uh, a series of two case-based learning tutorials a week uh, for 32 weeks in each of year one and year two that they go through. And we're trying to embed a, a, a teaching electronic medical record uh, around that um, and in addition uh, in introducing students to skills in clinical informatics and digital health we, we hope it'll also allow us to better support their learning in a more general sense uh, by the the informatics we're getting from them uh, this has been published on the, the prototype version and as Kathleen mentioned it, it's grounded in uh, the standard of fast healthcare interoperability resource uh, that's something developed uh, originally by uh, Graham Grieve out of Melbourne and something that's been uh, increasingly adopted across electronic medical records. And the great strength of it is the, uh, the ability that it's going to allow more sharing of data uh, between systems. And it's a nice enduring standard that uh, is at the absolute core of the platform that CSIRO are building for us. The other thing that it permits is uh, smart on fire apps. Uh, so essentially apps like you'd have on your smartphone or other device uh, that launch within our teaching EMR. And, and we've greatly enjoyed projects in the last uh, two years of medical students and IT students working collaboratively to, to devise these apps that, that we've then used in our teaching cases. Uh, the, the platform has a, a case authoring tool a case presentation tool and a dashboard for both students and their tutors. Uh, because it's fire, it could conceivably sit on top of an actual uh, Cerner or Epic electronic medical record with the appropriate translation, but our, our use right now is it sits on top of a simulated EMR in the CSIRO. I'm just showing a few screenshots of what it looks like, and, and if time permits, I'll run through a very quick demonstration of the actual platform. Uh, but essentially what we have is uh, a, a setup that looks a lot like a Cerner ENR, which has been rolled out uh, progressively across all Queensland health facilities. Uh, there's the, the, the narrative case teaching that's shown here where we break it up into triggers and discussion points. And as students progress through the case, the EMR sections of history, conditions, in investigations are, are populated. Uh, with data that the students can review. Uh, in addition to this, I made mention of smart on fire apps. And here were a couple of examples in this case that would launch within the platform uh, for things like a Glasgow Coma Scale or a Lund Browder uh, burn score as, as was relevant to this case. In the background, all the, the key data that's in the case is coded as uh, fire resources uh, in, in relevant uh, taxonomies such as SNOMED. And behind the scenes, the case author uh, allows fairly rapid creation of these simulated cases with, with templates that an author can enter these data without any knowledge themselves of SNOMED or, or FIRE. Uh, they're just typing in the relevant numbers and all the, uh, the resource codings done behind the scenes. Uh, medications uh, can be entered and used in the case and these search uh, from the relevant uh, Australian databases via the CSIRO ONTO server. And in terms of where we're at, at the moment, we trialled this thing in small scale with a prototype in 2018 with 30 students. 
In 2019, we had it operating in large scale with about a half a dozen cases for over 900 students. We've done the same again with another 20 cases used by 900 students this year, and we're just iteratively enhancing the platform. Uh, key things at the moment are the additional features to support in a professional education. In terms of evaluation, uh, our survey data from the students has been generally positive, but certainly their expectations are high. Uh, some of the things you alluded to, Stephen, about students preferring uh, the standard PDF case and, and the, the challenges of using a different platform, it's the normal type of change you'd see with integrating an EMR into any, any circumstance, I suppose. And I'll just very quickly go now. So for students using the platform, they have the capacity to make uh, decisions as they move through the case. They can then see information and encounter notes that are populated in the case, uh, physical exam scores and any investigations that have been done. They're also able now to add their own history notes and kind of a key development that we're at at the moment is trying to better root clinical informatics uh, in the actual use of the platform. And uh, I had on a slide just back here. where we're allowing the students to enter the data. At the moment, they're just entering uh, free text notes. Uh, in the current development of the platform, uh, they're able to use the, uh, the shrimp tool devised by uh, the Australian Health Research Centre that lets students and case authors very easily search uh, the SNOMED terms and, and add them very simply and quickly. And it's creating these lovely little learning activities where students have the option now to either enter structured SNOMED data in or LOINC uh, or their own free text. And then we can start to highlight the differences in, in what it actually means when they use these, these data in different ways. And just finally, this is the actual platform. It's set up at the moment just under the um, Australian Authentication Network. So access is, is, uh, is uh, feasible by single sign-on for um, any of the Australian University Network. And this here is the back end uh, of the, the actual case author platform. We've got about 20 cases on there at the moment. And just very quickly, this is the uh, the tools that are available for editing cases. Uh, so there's the creation and entry of uh, a basic patient details that exist in the record. And as we move here and add triggers in the system, you see that we can put in whether there's any elapsed time that's happening or not. And that can be in the instance of minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, or years to, to look at more longitudinal cases. Uh, decision points and choices can be included. And for instance, if you were to add some results in the case, it's got these templates readily set up that just allow you to enter uh, and select from and retain information as you choose. These are all built in at the moment. Uh, there's a, a template editor just about to be released that's going to be very important for our extension of the platform to other health professions so that the tools and the access to the terminologies relevant to their disciplines are all available. So thanks again for letting me demonstrate that and um, I've enjoyed very much the presentations today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. Um,
we have a little bit of time. We're doing well for time. Um, if anybody does have any uh, burning questions they'd like to ask, Ben, feel free to, to ask right now. Um, otherwise, I will hand back over to Kathleen and perhaps um, the rest of the talks might spur some ideas um, where Ben could plug back in for us in the discussion time. Yep. Hi. My foot back to you, Kathleen. Yep. Thanks, Mark. Um, and thank you, Ben. Thanks very much. Um, this, I think, is a really interesting because of the sponsorship that it has um, through CSIRO eHealth Research Centre. This is our tax dollar at work. <laughs> and so we should all be thinking about how we might plug into this work and adapt it or marry it with some of the other solutions that people are presenting. And we've got five minutes or so before we hear from our next speaker. So I'm just going to suggest that we all, unless there are there's, any um, questions. There's just a quick, uh, Chris yep. Baines just put a sign poster in there. Chris wants to mention something. Okay, go Chris. Thanks Kathleen. I just thought, cause I'm conscious that many in the audience are more from the health education background than the informatics background. So um, you've seen the tool that Ben's described, which is very impressive. I think a really important thing to understand just at a high level is this thing called fire that is essential to this um, is a great way, probably the only way really to standardize descriptions of cases in a way that all of these systems we've spoken about today could in theory share. Now that's not a simple thing, but there really isn't any other way to express cases in data that these systems can share. So not saying that's gonna to happen tomorrow, but it's useful to think about if you're making artificial cases um, and it's a very rich way to describe them. So just at that high level without going into all the details. Yep, good. Yes, thanks, Chris. I do appreciate you emphasising that. Actually, the 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 apps that can run on this platform uh, because they're produced in Fire. Uh, in fact, we we're adding a couple of apps this semester that uh, students at Georgia Tech in their health IT course have developed over there, and they they quite readily will launch on the, on the platform built here by CSIRO. Good. Anyone else? Any other comments or questions on this bracket? Well, let's take a five minute break and uh, have a wriggle, get a hot cuppa, and be back at 11 o'clock sharp to hear from our last speaker and have some open discussion about what we've learned, what we think we're going to do individually and what we think might be our collective next steps. So see you back here at 11 o'clock sharp. Thank you. For today's webinar, Mr. Neville Board is the Chief Digital Health Officer in the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services. Thanks very much, Neville. Uh, you're sharing your slides and uh, we look forward to hearing what you've got to say from your perspective on what we're trying to do in health profession education here. Thank you. Yep. Um, that's great. So look, I thought Kathleen probably the most useful thing would be provide some context on EMRs in Victoria. Is that a useful thing for the group? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I haven't come here to sell you anything or to defend a government program, but um, sometimes the context isn't clear to all the participants of the world we work in. So I just thought I'd work through some of the the, the uh, way we look at things and you might tell me if that's helpful or not and, and probably worth reminding although everyone's got these vision statements there's a strong commitment by Victorian governments to place-based care and looking after vulnerable communities the local solutions and really um, being person-centered and that's not just a health thing think of community services think of education uh, our department which is a big mega department it's not a health department it's health human services housing emergency management family safety, regulatory, uh, there's a whole, whole bunch of things, but the last step sec for housing was very clear. They didn't want to be a rent collector. They wanted to be a hub for targeting vulnerable populations for, for more support. So that's very real. And I think we're all here because we're digital health nerds, um, but just wanted to walk through 
the way we're approaching things because there is much more to this world than EMRs. And so if we are gonna get people off paper, um, we really need ICT not to fall down. So bottom one, reliable systems, that's both cyber and uptime. Um, we need to get off paper because that makes it hard to provide connected supported care. We need to join things up for the patient who's on the journey. And we actually need to do a lot better, more advanced things. So this was our roadmap with more advanced uses of health information and consumer centered approach. Um, we're actually gonna rejig that a little bit. Uh, the pandemic has seen a, a, a long overdue uptake in telehealth and digitally enabled care and government. And, and I think a lot of providers are pretty keen to keep running with that, both to reduce the travel burden on patients and to perhaps provide more contemporary models of care. Uh, in, in Victoria, we don't measure um, digital maturity by have you got an EMR. Um, we've done a nice piece of work. I say we it was done by before me by good people, so I take no credit for it. Um, an auditor general report um, flagged, and we get these every so often, uh, that there wasn't really a nice way of measuring digital maturity that would allow government to plan and health services to plan and assess. And uh, I'm putting it out there, I don't think the HINGS MRAN model is probably best fit for the way health services are evolving. And to be fair to them, they've moved on also I'm looking at a, a more contemporary way of doing that. But uh, our maturity model, and we've really spent quite a lot of time on this and then actually applied it to Victoria's 82 health services. And we're about to test it with the 29 independent community health organisations. You can see left to right, organisational capability, ICT ops and infrastructure, i.e. doesn't fall over and is cyber secure, digitisation getting off paper, security and privacy, information sharing and integration, analytics, the consumer face, user experience and innovation. No surprises there for you, but this is how uh, we, and probably health services will self-assess, will be assessed against this every two years. And the maturity levels in each pillar looks kind of like this. And I think it's fair to say Victorian health services with a lot of variation are around two. So obviously Royal Children's is a shiny, wonderful hospital new kit, new building, had Epic for a couple of years, really building their models of care on top of that, providing outreach across the state to all sorts of rural and regional providers. But broadly, there's a, a bit of a bell curve of maturity, uh, but we're sort of around two in, uh, uh, overall, with obviously some of them more than that. And there is definitely a, in the rural hospitals, a lower level of digital maturity than the metros. Um, why are we here? I just love to bring these out. The three classic safe studies, the uh, Harvard Medical Practice 1989, Quality in Australian Healthcare 1994, to Urish Human Institute of Medicine 1999. I think it might have covered, that's the article. Um, we know that we need to do better because there is harm. And that's probably why a lot of us around the table Here's what an unfilled, beautiful national inpatient medication chart looks like, hospitals full of complex meds. Um, and clearly if that is our world with scroll, high risk meds, doses, lack of prompt, yeah, harm happens, which is why all of these studies actually started to count harm in the acute environment. Um, clearly just with meds as an example, wouldn't it be nice if pharmacists and nurses saw these when they went to dispense and administer wouldn't it be good if the GPs could see that? And wouldn't it be good if community mental health outreach workers could also see what they're on? So that's just a little bit of a recap of why we're there. And if you just take the antimicrobial stewardship example, once we get off paper, then you can run dashboards that aren't formal performance reporting to funders or government, but are just harvesting what's happening and giving you near real time and retrospective views about things that are very important. So you can drive down inappropriate use of antimicrobials or falls or whatever extended ED wait times. Um, I'm just gonna pause for a tick and I was just gonna then go through where we're up to with digitization in Victoria. Kathleen, is this useful for the group? Because I'm happy to go, go further to workforce if you need. No, this is super devil. Please keep going. Happy to okay. direction. Yeah. So then the um, the context we wake up in often is um, where we're up to in Victoria. 
and interjurisdictional competition sometimes it's healthy and sometimes helps business cases but for what it's worth in case you get asked we are at 50.4% of public hospital beds uh, in a hospital with an EMR. And over the next couple of months, depending on how we get out of um, the, current, the current context that has seen projects have to, have to push back, um, Royal, Hospi Royal Women's Hospital, Royal Melbourne and Peter Mac were due to go live in August. That's still the, the date planned. Uh, La Trobe Regional Hospital, a centre of Gippsland, also they've have turned on all scripts in ED. Um, they're really on track to have an EMR and Bendigo as a regional. So those ones are in the pipe and, and, and not far off, I think, probably this year. So that'll see the number get up to 58, 59, 60%. Uh, and there's some more projects that are at least um, dollar ready, shovel ready. Uh, perhaps Northern uh, is health's probably next example of Mercy and some gaps. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. And, and I would just flag for folk um, in terms of hospital EMRs, and there's much more to life than hospital EMRs, that it's a big capital ask. So most of Australian hospitals run on activity-based funding, as you know, and private hospitals, it's the equivalent. They get case mix type dollars from insurers, plus or minus a bit of private, privately cash paid. So when you want to upgrade all your kit so systems don't fall over, get licenses for whatever the heck you're buying, do a proper training program, put a team in place, get all the integration with all of your lab systems and your dispense meds and all of that, it's big dollars. And how do hospitals find a lump of dollars when their cash flows are kind of quarterly amounts of money pertaining to projected or, or recent activity? Um, and it's tough. So in Victoria, uh, hospitals, have, I think, are more um, they're more devolved. So some of them do good things and generate a surplus. Um, some of them government helps, and we try to help. We probably don't um, probably get as much capital as some of the hospitals would like. And um, some of them, um, uh, 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 some of them struggle to get the dollars. And you know, we're in a constant cycle of trying to help. And often you can funded if you had a longer period or a payback period you probably can start generating the benefits that we all believe in short length of stay less harm less duplication more patient-centered experience more efficient discharge so you probably can drive that back but those options aren't always available in the form of a you know a, a, an advanced payment or interest rate loan things like that uh, and you will see in the private hospital sector much less uptake of EMRs, and I suspect because they just don't get every so often dollars of the government money, to uh, which which is how most states have triggered EMRs is by getting extra capital in. Um, the one private that did a whiz bang one was uh, Harvey Bay and Stevens, and that was because it got a grant from the feds of forty million to just do it, and they did it. And uh, the San, the Sydney Adventist hospitals pretty much done a great job and that's really large with locally developed stuff. So there's some of the issues and of course each each year hospital boards have to decide where do we put our money. Now there's two hospitals in Australia that are in the world's top 50 according to sort of a reasonably well accepted set of metrics. <coughs> They're Royal Melbourne and Alfred Health and Alfred Health went live with a really well planned EMR um, last year and Royal Melbourne's on the path for Epic. They would have gone live in um, May, were it not for the difficulties of, of staffing and training in the pandemic and the change workflows. So um, we know that it's good, but it, it, is, it is tough. Um, second thing I thought I'd provide some context is sometimes folk come, and I, I don't have a lot of patience for the comment, why don't you just have one EMR in Victoria? And I think if you took a service-based approach to design, um, we have liberated our hospitals. They um, go down a path of product selection. We have to approve and assure that, so it's not every every person for himself. But um, I think if you were a Parkville precinct, um, with all that genomic stuff floating around and research and we high and Royal Children's and cutting edge CAR T therapies, you know, one of those big, big modern, um, well established systems, not cheap like Epic, is probably the right thing. And I think if you're a rural or regional hospital and you go down the track path that Southwestern Victoria and Bendigo has, that's probably the right thing for those places too. 
Um, so I don't see that there is um, one one model fits all. And you might find in states have done a single system rollout and you scratch the surface there. You know, there's not quite so much happiness in each hospital if they haven't been involved in product selection. Uh, do we need this one big box? I don't even know if the states have a single instance of, of their common brand AMR, but really you just need a health information exchange to, to exchange certain things between hospitals. You don't see every full blood count every four hours of an ICU patient two years later because it was in the AMR. So they're just some of the myths that I'm not that comfortable with. I think it is appropriate to um, get bottom-up site level uh, involvement in product selection, and that's often a one or two year period. Um, that strengthens your implementation and championship. And, and I think we need to join up certain things, but we, I'm not sure the case is made for one single um, EMR across the state. That's a personal view. Um, so we've got in Victoria, Sona, all scripts, Sunrise, uh, all scripts, Epic and Track. And other players are appearing, you probably know about that. I don't know which ones we'll go with. Obviously, IPM's got this Lorenzo thing, and I don't know how, you know, whether, I don't think there's any examples of EMR in, in Australia. Might be in the NHS, MedTech's coming, and Telstra's obviously looking, Telstra Health's obviously working on something. So there will be other things, and it's quite possible if you built an EMR today, it might not look like the classic big ones in the sector because you do all sorts of things differently today. Other concept that might be useful, I think, is that there's often no perfectly right answer in core versus bespoke. So typically you will um, say, what do we need for most of our function? We need a classic EMR, we need meds, we need clinical notes, we need referrals, we need results, reporting and ordering those things. When you then get to how do we do mental health, how do we do paediatrics, how do we do ICU, how do we do oncology, how do we do radiotherapy? There's been a world of bespoke applications, they're very good. Do you want to run two uh, in your hospital, one for oncology, one for everyone else? Do you buy the, or, or do you say, okay, we're going to look after mental health, we'll buy the CERNAL or the EPIC or the TRACK mental health module? Or um, we've got this really nice one that's been developed and it's cool and it's cheaper and it's locally developed. So we'll go with that. And then how do you integrate? And some of the areas that's very painful, particularly, is in, in the area of um, scheduling. So radiotherapy, once a person's having a treatment, you sort of run this very complex schedule of putting in fractions and uh, skipping weekends, coming back for CT in the middle, and that might, might be just too much for PAS or it might not be automatable. Uh, but on the other hand, how many schedules do you want around one patient in one hospital? Uh, same with chemo, it'd be good to prescribe electronically. You know, Some of the mainstream stuff doesn't go that well with the complexities of, of a chemotherapy regimen over a couple of months. So. That's where the bespoke one's in. So I don't think there's an answer for that. I think that integration space is a really tricky one um, and you might see products starting to join up. A uh, couple of other things I would flag before I take questions, I think, is um, we really need to do more stuff outside hospitals. We're not making much of a dent in chronic disease management. You're all aware of that. We talk about it all the time at our conferences. The sort of difficulties in interfacing good joined up information between general practice, community mental health, you know, NGOs delivering alcohol and other drug services. It's a tough one, um, but if you don't get off paper, it's, e it's even tougher. Uh, but there is a real commitment to do more. A funding model kind of makes it a bit difficult to look after populations at the moment. But that's there. And the other thing is, I think we're all are aware that consumers or perhaps uh, so a lot of people like us aren't in hospital very often, all kind of healthy middle-class people, but my dad's 91, so I might be doing it on his behalf, but consumer-facing stuff, can I jump on and book an appointment? Can I look at my results? Or can I sort of at least see what the discharge letter was so I can have a chat with my GP or perhaps with my dad's GP? That consumer-facing stuff, portals, apps, you know about it. You can't do that from paper, so we still have to digitise and get there. Uh, and the last area I think that I would just flag with you as um, an example of how complex life is, is often the most vulnerable high users of primary care and of hospitals are often also um, frequent flyers in um, community housing, justice, education. So vulnerable is vulnerable. And we're a long way off joining that up at the moment. And that's probably a better way to look after citizens. 
as context, Victoria does have unique patient identification. We're rolling it out. It was a recommendation from the Targeting Zero review. And that's, uh, we're just bringing on each health service information sharing agreement. It's a nice piece of software with Nextgate, nice implementation partner with MKM. Uh, we're not yet able to use that to join clinical information because uh, A, we've got to do some tweaks to legislation so they can run off the common platform. And B, um, we would then have to buy some kind of health information exchange. So that business case is ahead of us. Uh, but that is happening and it's real. And most of you are aware of my health record and my message to rural hospitals and to GPs is 90% of people have a my health record. There's a lot of good stuff in there. There's quite a lot of discharge summary, quite a lot of community dispensed meds, quite a lot of GP stuff. Why don't we start with that instead of whinging and, and, and really targeting, making good use of what's already there um, while we can. And uh, the last 12 months, Part of our team's been connecting Victorian Health Service to my health record, both load stuff and to view. And this financial year, um, we're really focusing more on view, meaningful use, change and adoption. Uh, and if I was a small rural hospital, a long way off an EMR, and perhaps not knowing what, what's the most appropriate solution for those rural places that have a lot of GP and aged care elements, then maybe getting really good use of my health records a really good start in my region. Um, Kathleen, that was some context I thought that might underpin that. Did you want a little bit of an overlay on workforce where we're at at the moment? Look, that would be lovely. And we certainly have time for it, Neville. So, um, yes, please. Kathleen, that might, um, there's a question in the chat box for you, Neville and Kathleen, um, that might actually fit nicely with that. Um, I'll flick that to you, Neville. You can see it in the chat box there. Um, maybe that can be a segue into what you're about to say uh, from Chris Bain there. Kind of working at a, at a macro level level, um, what a work ready graduate um, who enters the Vic Health system as their first job should know when it comes to digital health and informatics. And that might be just from your experience, not necessarily wearing your official hat. Yeah, look, thanks for that. Um, I can't, for some reason, I can't see the chat box, but um, that's okay. So thanks, Chris. Look, I, I have this personal view that I'm not quite sure what a doctor or nurse or pharmacist or physio coming out of uni, whether they need to be told about digital things or whether having done their whole degree with digital enablement, they need specific training in any more than they needed training in the National Inpatient Medication Charter. So I'm not sure on that. I think people who are going to champion, support, lead, May, uh, promote investment, do business cases, uh, take people through new functionality, do. Uh, that's the workforce I'm interested in. I think we have an issue of people my age, uh, nursing, I'm a nurse, who perhaps struggle with the change. I'm never quite sure what the digital bit is of new grads coming in that needs to be called out as digital. Chris, do you want to just tell me a little bit more about the, the use case or the problem statement? It's more just Neville, you know, as, as you're obviously having to deal with EMRs all the time and given your long history yourself, if you had a particular strong view one way or the other about what they needed to know, it sounds like the answer is no, and, and that's, that's fine too. Um, it's interesting. I think this is a certainly the more people I talk to with my uni hat on these days, I think this is a heavily evolving space about where we end up about what we think we need to teach them and hence what they need to have when they leave. I don't think it's a solved problem, at least in Victoria and Australia. Yeah, Chris, look, just thought bubbles from me. Um, I think the framework, the Digital Health Agency did the useful starting point. I always try not to replicate work other people have done, and that's got different different kind of settings. Uh, but what I would like um, new grads to, to worry about, whether they're nursing, medicine, pharmacy, uh, probably physios and occupational therapists, and sorry for everyone else, I've forgotten speech therapists, um, is the notion of safety and the fact that there's a classic area of safety that's orthographic, transcription, uh, setting design, classic medication errors. And then there are some very device specific things. So screen design, heuristics, illogical screen flow, 
misidentification through having things open. I would really like all new grads to worry about safety and have some more of that because a lot of that is either in poor device design, the user interface, or can be resolved by taking a heuristic or human factors approach rather than a let's keep training people, let's put out advisories and things like that. Um, I think people learning the balance of um, decision support versus alert fatigue, some of those conundrums. So classic example, it's really good, I think, for GPs to be flagged allergies and to be reminded of therapeutic ranges. And they may not need that, some do, some don't. There'd be a big variation. I think if you turn on um, decision support and alerts for a hospital, public hospital renal dialysis unit, everyone will flag all the time. The electrolytes is all over the shop. So, you know, what's, what's the titration and things like that. So that is, I think, something people should worry about. I think the issue of misidentification, safety, they should worry about. I think the notion of continuity and how I get stuff into, into um, discharge or transfer of care should be something they know about and worry about the limitations of provider directories. So yeah, I think, I think it's like, if you look at the FDA now, what they're doing with AI, they're not saying let's evaluate AI, they do every single widget on its merits as a thing, not as a piece of AI, what's our approach to AI. Um, and I think that we should look at specific um, use cases in health, uh, and then start looking at where tech and digital make a difference. So if you were to, let's say, start looking at second opinion from AI, which is digital for reading um, chest X-rays or some kind of a scan, this is really, and you know, here's the widget, here's the risks. We've developed a different population. We don't understand the black box, or it's really good and it just flags everything, you know, a whole of false positives and suddenly got all these worried well, being more worried, spending a lot more money. You know. so I think some of those digital conundrums are really useful. Uh, and I would certainly start with safety. I, I don't know if I've answered your question. And then there's another layer of folk who want to help and lead and do the next thing. <laughs> on top of. Um, so we got a commitment. It's pretty low level. We'll fund chair for um, rural health services. We're just working with Kathleen on per module, how we can just at least make that available. We haven't got an overarching workforce strategy, Chris, and that, that's probably a bandwidth thing as much as anything else. We know that the good people are really scarce and we know that it's difficult in rural Victoria to get the calibre of leaders you can get in a, in a big city. Thanks, Neville. Because you can't read the chat, I'll tell you what I typed. That's a valuable perspective, Neville, with some good specifics. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I have a question, Neville. This is Wendy. Hi, Wendy. So a lot of us are, oh, let me turn my camera back on, um, are, are working. Oh, so you're not on a bicycle. No. <laughs> in, up in a mountain in Utah, no. <laughs> um, a lot of us are working on all kinds of materials to help teach people in more hands-on way how to use data and reason with it, um, using the EMR to help think about documentation and, and decision making. Uh, but we would like to do something more collaborative where, uh, because none of us can do this all alone. And I don't know the best approach for us to work in a, in a more strategic way to really serve the needs of our health professionals. Mm, mm. The, the emerging ones and the current ones. In terms of workforce? In terms of workforce development. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and I think um, it's, it's, it's a tough one. I would still go back to the use case. Um, approach. Uh, so we are currently getting off paper. It's a 30 year journey, but one day that journey will finish and one day quite soon and we'll then worry about different things and they will be safety, connectedness of care, appropriateness, consumer experience, um, self-management. Uh, so I'd be, I would again be targeting concepts like self-management, um, the risks around apps as well as the benefits, how you assess things. Uh, I, I, I'm not a workforce expert, but I, I kind of think problem solving is probably more of a thing. And, and you might then look at some existing things about a cohort of you know, poorly managed diabetics. What's the answer? Yeah, yeah and I think, I think a lot of us have those at our own universities or are working on them. But, you know, statewide, is there a way to leverage all of our expertise and have us work together in creating curriculum 
that could be shared across everyone rather than everybody just inventing everything themselves? Mm. Uh, yes, yes. So, you know, the, the conundrum, I guess. So look, it's a fact that we don't do as many good things as we should. So that's just a fact. It's probably a bandwidth issue. And um, so should state government work to coordinate workforce development? Yes. Do I have any humans to do it? No. Um, do I think it's a good thing? Yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm one. And then what happens is we, we get some, you've got seven-ish universities doing good things. And with Nice, I think sort of a niche approach, but um, is your question, what would a core curriculum look like nope. for the digital element of health workers? No, it's how do we get a structure in place at the state level where um, we, we can work together and create a shared model and that's more efficient and more comprehensive and strategic. Mm. And how do you leverage us? Because you don't have the people to do this, but we're all working in the space. Mm. How, you know, is, is, is there a way to bring us together at a state level? Um, yeah, look, look, it'd be worth writing down what problem we're trying to solve with that. Uh, I'm a supporter of that. And uh, maybe um, we could test that. Uh, I'm hearing that universities are in a position to collaborate on this, uh, and that's that's great. And also note there will be different capabilities in different universities. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be happy to test that with our advisory group. Uh, uh, definitely, I probably just need a bit more clarity on, on what problem we're trying to solve. Okay, work on that. Hey, back to you, Kathleen. I think. Yeah. Sure. I might just share my screen for a minute. Um, right here. Um, and I'm conscious that we have a number of people on the webinar who are long standing health profession educators. And we, we haven't heard from them. I'm sure there's been lots of interested active listening. But I'd like to hear from some of our audience what they what they found most interesting about the shared experiences we've presented today and what what educators need next to get on with this. And then uh, th really the third question is Wendy's question. And I'm, I'm hearing from Neville that we need to communicate clearly to management and governance of the health sector what we are doing in this education space and i think some of our professional associations will be uh, up to that with us but uh would others like to jump in at this point and talk about you know what you've heard that's inspiring or too hard or mm, not directed to the educational challenges that you're facing just going to leave that up for a moment and, and open it up to comment either in the chat window or um, via just speaking out. Perhaps um, well, if anyone wants to say something, they could maybe just say, um, yep, me or something in the, in the chat box and I can, that way I can keep it organised. We don't have uh, four, 30 people all talking at once. So please, please feel free to um, just to mention if you'd like to say something and, and we'll, we'll get you up. I'd like okay. to say something. Great. This is Tina Brock. Yeah, please, Tina. I was just wondering, and again, I, I dialed in just a few minutes late, so this might have, you know, I, you, we've seen obviously the, the pandemic has accelerated lots of digital health initiatives that were designed, you know, previously predicted to take decades. Um, so how will this change? How can we use this pressure to, to accelerate the digital health education movement as well? Um, and, and really sort of use that pressure to convert people um, as we go along. I, I'm very keen to not let the crisis get a waste. So who, is that question to anyone? Absolutely anybody. <laughs> Please solve my problems for me. I would really appreciate it. 
Uh, if I can reflect, um, certainly on the health service perspective, our contacts with the health services is they are very keen to do more um, digitally enabled and virtually enabled care post pandemic for a range of reasons. Mm. Mark, I just. Yeah, I yeah, please, just, please, Chris. Yeah, just make a comment too, Tina. You're right, there's something in all this about not just in the operational sense, but um, what and how and when we educate students about this as well. I think there's a really interesting phenomenon if I drill down on one part of this, and it is patchy. You know, there are some, if we just consider this concept of telehealth, video consultations, virtual care, which covers a multitude of sins, there's some examples that have either sprouted in the setting of COVID or been heavily accelerated in the setting of COVID. I'm thinking of RPA virtual and even some stuff I've seen out of Royal Melbourne that um, are actually more like what that future looks like. But if you go and actually look at the statistics from MBS funding of telehealth at the minute with the huge boost in numbers, 90% of it's phone calls just phone calls and yes gp consultations dominate those stats but even if you look at you know specialist consultations which are smaller figures um huge dominance of phone calls in those settings so i think there's something really interesting about um operational opportunities to go well we can do a lot better than that guys already <laughs> um but also in terms of educating people formally informally about about this future called digital health which is yeah, because to me, in many ways, using the phone has been functionally important, but it's actually potentially a step backwards on safety. And it's not necessarily helpful if we believe in all that digital health could be. So just an observation, I suppose. Anybody else like to share anything? Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> Sorry, one more thing from, from me, Tina. Yeah, I was please. just gonna say, thanks, Chris. I mean, you know, I'm increasingly, you know, we're, for those of us who have been re emergency remote teaching in, in first semester and then transitioning to what this looks like um, going forward, you know, I, I, I am, con I'm interested that we are using systems that are not, that weren't designed for what we're using them for. And they're um, on the educational side, there's some issues there. And on the healthcare side, there's some issues there. It doesn't mean we shouldn't, you know, shouldn't forge ahead, but, you know, in watching some of the ransomware attacks and things that are going on at um, universities and health systems, I, you know, I, yeah, it's sort of like, let's, le let's leapfrog the phone. <laughs> That's basically what I'm trying to, to think about. Neville? Yeah, uh, thanks. I just, I did put something in the, in the chat. I, I, I don't want to be defensive, but I, I think the 90%, I think GPs are just doing phone calls and getting MBS for it. And I know there's concerns that um, there will be some inappropriate use of that. Um, that's, it's only done till September. Uh, I, I would say um, we've seen obviously hospital, which is basically certain types of outpatient substitution has gone up from 2,000 to 50,000 video calls greater than five minutes a month. So that's real, not everything, and there's much more to life than video calls. Um, but what's been interesting is we also were able to do a rapid acceleration, and I'm calling it our lateral one, where the Health Direct platform that's owned by six Australian, seven Australian governments, and pretty good service, um, we've provided that through our contract to a bunch of independent community health organisations, community-based mental health providers, some drug and alcohol NGOs, maternal child health. So they're also moving off the phone uh, and, and that whole toolkit of um, how do I prepare, which part of our work is amenable to video calls, which part isn't, which clients might struggle with that, which ones might not, clients or patients. So um, I think that's there. But if we got, if GPs and specialists did use proper telehealth, not phones, then the next bit is, you know, what's the right sensor, what's the right monitor, what are the risks? So this will be an evolving journey. And, and I guess to loop right back, Wendy, to, you, to your question about what, what, what are the things for curriculum and training and stuff like that, well, that might be how to improve care of patients with AF in a remote community-based model or specialist rooms-based model. Um, 
where the digital is just part of the environment and then you look at the tools and the risks and the safety and the sensitivity and things like that but um yeah i i think um the, the a lot of them could do better than doing doing a phone call and i think it's that whole gp environment that they don't have much time with the patient they don't have much overheads to to make investments kathleen you would like to take over just jump in and say coming back to the remarks i made at the start about so it's a little bit it's a little bit faint again kathleen oh, okay. sorry that right. others might be having that problem uh, try again talk better yeah there you go okay good this is our this is our regional internet <laughs> at work <laughs> um, yeah um i think going back to the point i made earlier about the need for evidence to underpin what we're doing in education and why. I, I wonder what effort is being done to collect the experiences of patients and consumers during the past little while to feed into guiding how much emphasis we put on communication, connecting up the dots, using one platform or another. Um, Neville, would you like to comment on how from your perspective, you're tapping into what this has actually been like for the for the consumers of the services? Yeah, look, um, so first of all, that is correct. We need to test with patients and clients what you know what the experience was like for them. And we haven't done that. So we've been in pandemic sprint mode. And uh, in so in the the rapid dissemination of that initially driven by reducing risk of infection to both patients and providers. And then in this space where, oh, actually this is good. And, and the, the anecdote I have, and anecdotes are sometimes useful, is I got the tram to Peter Mac uh, and I got off, the, sorry, I got the tram from Southern Cross and a, a young woman with a pram and a child had got off the train from somewhere, Ballarat, Bendigo, Wimmera, I don't know where, and was walking to Royal Children's because she didn't understand the prams. Now, didn't understand the trams. So that just should never happen. So that's six hours for what was probably a 30 minute consult, plus or minus a test. Um, so I, what I'd like to say is we should do well-designed surveys of both providers and clients and patients of how they went with video calls. And that should be the platform for continually trying to improve the service. We, we haven't done that yet. Yeah, I, I, I think you're excused for, for not getting onto that. Plenty to, mm. to do before that. But perhaps that's an area where um, some collaboration with the universities might help you to get some of that done. And that might help us then to inform some of the cases that we build and some of the teaching that we do to make it more pertinent going forward. Yep, yep. Um, and I'm not, I haven't, I missed the start and I'm really sorry, it's just been um, a bit of a tough week. Uh, uh, how many universities are around the table, can I ask? Like I've, we, Chris, we, Chris is Monash, you and Wendy are Melbourne. Is any other universities around the table today? Stephen Guinea from Australian Catholic University actually yep. was one of the initiators of the work that led to today's webinar. Um, and we issued an open invitation to the learning and teaching directors mm. of all of the Victorian University's health sciences schools, but we didn't ask people to sign up or pay money. So I'm not sure how many other universities are here today, but certainly I would predict um, at least you the majority yeah. of breaking up Kathleen yeah. would be interested. Just say to Sandeep's definitely been um, on the line for part of it. So Deacon. about four, Deacon, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so look if I mean it probably helps when we spend taxpayers' money, there's a whole lot of diligence around it. I support that can be cumbersome. Um, 
about you know an, an idea of which university is niches so who is good at administering well-designed patient experience surveys that would kind of be useful um, our victorian age of health information does have carriage of all of that so we'd probably go to them in the first place say what kind of survey it is but i think you'd need to redesign a survey around the telehealth experience so there's also really good to know who's there's good also a question in the chat box um from zarina just saying that often this type of research um, access to patients is governed by the health services um, and how we might be able to say break those barriers between the service and the researchers outside of those services. Um, maybe, maybe just something to think about as we go forward to. Um, over to you, Kathleen, again. Yeah, so I would want to break the ethics approval process and the informed consent to participate, but certainly we know that it can take many months just to get something like that going as a research project. So um, that in itself is something to work towards in collaboration with, with your area, Neville. Um, Mark, I think you know, we are approaching the lunch hour and you do have some final comments. We, we've asked Stephen and Chris to, yeah, to give yeah. their thoughts. Yep, um, we might, I might first go to, uh, to Steve, the Steve Guinea that is. Um, Steve, I've, I've floated something a bit earlier, perhaps just for discussion at this part of the morning, um, which was in relation to teaching and going back to the um, hybrid models that we're still in, going to be encountering, paper and electronic. Um, and uh, again, perhaps a, a round table discussion about how others um, integrating Australian specific standards, such as early warning systems, vital signs, um, validity of prescription, I might flip that back to you, Steve, because um, that was your your signpost. Um, yeah, for sure. And, and I think it, platform. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Mark. That's a dangerous thing to do. I think it's um, uh, it, it does actually reflect a little bit of what Neville was talking about earlier in terms of how what what we need to uh, what we need to be providing uh, education around our undergraduates for and the questions around that. So I guess my my query is when we're looking at uh, electronic medical record platforms in. Uh, healthcare, and we know that we have, from an education perspective, we're using things like the National Inpatient Medication Chart as a quality uh, tool, and we're also looking at early warning systems and between the flags, etc., on, on in different states and territories. Uh, but uh, I think this is a real interesting situation where we have that tension between paper-based and electronic-based, where electronic medical records don't necessarily reflect uh, those standards uh, and principles. And so I'd be curious to know what people are doing in terms of curriculum delivery, uh, design and delivery, in particular around those specific areas of uh, really it's, it's, it's uh, safety and quality in patient care. Might flick that over to the, to the group if anyone has any sort of comments or thoughts on that. Look, I think it's, again, I think we're, we're framing potential projects going forward and that's certainly one of them. <laughs> Just finding the resources to undertake it is probably one of our challenges, but the more of us prepared to pitch in and to argue that it's important for the value of the education we're providing, that the more likely we are to perhaps get the support where we need it to do that kind of work. I just I jump I'm, in there, Kathleen, yeah. um, for a minute. Um, I think um, when it comes down to the patient safety and quality um, in terms of the curriculum, it's really important to recognize that throughout the curriculums, we actually have that integrated and that the addition of digital health needs to actually um, integrate with what's existing there because it is very well embedded. It's really um, covered by the Australian Nursing and Delivery Council, for example, in terms of accreditation standards. But also, um, a lot of it is down to um, practical simulation as well, whereby um, these are continuously um, kept highlighted pretty much in every session that is being done. So I don't necessarily think that it's a brand new thing. What I think it is different is that it works in a different process manner. So for example, it wouldn't necessarily be horizontal in digital space like we would have it in on a paper format or in, in real sort of life interaction. Rather, I think how it occurs in digital space is um, an understanding how that process takes place in digital space is missing. And I think a lot of research from Canada, at least from the um, nursing informatics there, is certainly pointing that we need to think differently in how we integrate this in the digital space arena because 
this hybrid model, I think it makes it confusing in that respect, because what's happening on the paper and in digital sense is not necessarily identical. Kathleen, did you um did you still want to add to that? Thanks, Zarina. No, 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 right. Thank, thank, thank you, Zarina. Stephen waving his hand. Stephen Walker. Um, I guess I was just going to comment, I guess, and it's not really from like an overarching curriculum perspective, but we're going through a similar process at the moment where some of our medical staff are wanting to teach. Um, um, traditionally, they taught sort of like the abbreviation standards and with doctors engaging with drug charts. And obviously that's very different when you're engaging with EMR systems. So we're literally having a conversation this morning with our EHR Go team about making sure those standard abbreviations uh, embedded in their system but then part of me sort of do we need to teach that style anymore about the value of abbreviations and that sort of thing is there a different type of teaching that we should go down instead um, akin to what we achieved with things like the national inpatient um, drug chart but more in a digital space so I just wondered what people thought about that can I Neville yeah please Neville I'll just a uh tidying up about abbreviations. You may know this, Stephen, um, but there, there is a national standard for on-screen presentation of medicines um, that exists and has been signed off and endorsed and all. Do you know about that? Yeah, I guess it's sort of, I guess my question is like, the people who are developing those order sets would probably be the ones um, creating those standards. So I guess the choice from the clinician who's engaging with it unless they want to start going rogue and start free texting um, medications I guess I don't know how important it is as it was compared to other oh look I think it's really important so I, I think so um, we shouldn't need to abbreviate with digital that's the whole point uh, we certainly shouldn't be doing free text for prescribing but my, my, the way I see it is we use a common text on image Australian medicine terminology we do on-screen presentation because it's been heuristically shown to be safer and to be the lowest risk. We haven't done enough work on order sets. And when we do a clinical standard in Australia, clinical guideline, the order set should be a part of that. And that's not just medicines. It might be an ECG. It might be a component or something like that. I believe in all of those things. Uh, I think all the tools are there. Um, and that should be clinically led, not, not technically led. Um, what worries me sometimes is we're all so busy that sometimes some of the work's already been done isn't visible to the folk um but there, there are there are um real risks in in free tech and it was just when i did a walk around victorian hospital about six or seven years ago the amount of variation in just formulary even within one hospital was was quite distressing thanks neville thanks stephen and i might that's a nice segue i might now uh flick back to chris uh chris bain Chris, you were going to um, use the opportunity in wrap up to talk a little bit about um, UX and usability, uh, and you wanted to mention something about relationships with vendors. Yeah. Do you want to take over? Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I'll just start with the vendor thing first. And I think everyone has heard this thread a few times today from people who've dealt with vendors a lot, be it operationally like me or in the setting of trying to get um, educational versions of systems set up, it, it it's, continues to be an ongoing fraud exercise, especially in Australia, especially given our market size, especially given the money required and all sorts of other things, including the practical ability to use those things in education. So hopefully people saw a whole bunch of different options today that don't involve working with a EMR vendor. And, and to be fair, you know, that's not their job. Their business models aren't set up around that. So I think that's a useful lesson for others to take away. And just wanted to finish, I mean, it came, absolutely came up, uh, even in Wendy's first point, in using the Regan Street system for information searching, that, you know, the construct of usability under that. We know from international evidence that usability for clinicians of all clinical systems is one of the highest sources of problems for them, which flow on to all sorts of other things. Um, I just clicked a link around a little earlier to a, a Griffith hosted survey, which is for any kind of clinician anywhere around the country. It's very quick, it's under 10 minutes, uh, to ex explore and describe their experiences with usability of clinical information systems. It's supported by uh, Monash Griffith and the Australian Institute of Digital Health, and we hope to repeat it because it's actually based on a, 
a, an existing international survey. So just to, to flag that with people too. And thank you to all the speakers and thank you everyone for coming. So I'm hoping it was very valuable for people. Thanks everybody. Uh, thank Lovely you. to spend time. Neville's also sent around a link, everybody in the chat, just from the national guidelines of on-screen presentations of medicines. Uh, Kathleen, back to you. Uh, I'd uh, just like to reiterate Chris's comments. Thanks very much to everyone who agreed to present today and take the time. Thanks to everyone who attended. I have a lot of history in working with teaching academics and health professions on curriculum improvement, and curriculum renewal. And I think we can talk and talk and talk, but unless we find ways to engage the people who are actually in front of our students in thinking through some of these things and trying them out and connecting with those who know more and those who know less, uh, we, we aren't gonna make much progress. So I'm really pleased at the number of people who've taken time today to join us. And I hope that you will all pass on the fact that the webinar recording will be available for colleagues who were not able to be here today and um, you are very welcome to reach out to us chris steven myself and other speakers you've heard today uh, to follow up and let's see where we can take this thanks everyone have a Thank safe you, everyone. and happy weekend and um see you later Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks, well done. Everyone. See you. Bye.